Pace has dropped on a new week of soccer down here. John here, you there. Welcome to Soccer's Morning Show. Busy reaction Monday as always. Uh, Abe and or Garrett dropping by at 9.15 to discuss Atlanta United and Toronto FC. The one they'll loss for uh, Atlanta United in that one. There's plenty to talk about or the, the loss for Atlanta United uh, in that one. And uh, we'll get into that one coming up, obviously, throughout the show. We'll go through the numbers from SofaScore. And we'll get Abe and, and, uh, and or Garrett's thoughts on that. Uh, get your thoughts on Atlanta United. Get your thoughts on Major League Soccer. Get your thoughts on uh, anything else that popped into your head. We had the twos yesterday on the network. Big win for Atlanta United 2 and MLS Next Pro. 4 nil winners over Carolina Core. The postgame show is posted on the network. So if you've missed the postgame show with an added, what, a 12-inch, 8-inch bonus track, the, there's a DVD extra in uh, the in the post game show from yesterday. It is Maddie's interview with Carolina Core head coach Roy Lassiter. So, in the post game show that's on the network, it's Spreaker.com, and you do your search for soccer down here or on the SDH app on iOS and Android. If you are a true plus oneer, a uh, true A lister that has gone back that far with us, you get your highlights, you get your post. Maddie and Jarrett catch up with Steve Cook. They catch up with Luke Brennan. Catch up with John Berner. Maddie catches up with Roy Lasseter. So that's, uh, and uh, yeah, that's that was your extra DVD cut. So that's what's on the post game show. You can catch that on the network if you missed it yesterday when it was posted last night while we were all watching the CONCACAF Nations League final. And Bart Keeler is going to join us in hour number two to talk about yet another Dos Acero. Yet another one. I feel like it, I needed this is where I needed to have DJ Khaled. Uh, uh, DJ Khaled drop. Dos Acero. So uh, the U.S. wins the third CONCACAF Nations League in a row. And we'll get into the highlights in that as well. So once again, anything's on the table. And as we always do, it is right out there for you on a reaction Monday. So anything and everything is out there for you. And you can hang out. We're here till 11 whenever to discuss anything that's going on on your brain. Uh, opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. That's your QR code for those of you who are watching, however you are watching us. It could be on the 280-character app. It could be on the uh, Twitch, or it could be on our YouTube channel. There it is right there. That's your QR code from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Use that code, get you into Kickoff Coffee. Then use the code soccer down here 15 you get 15% off your purchase. They, in turn, take 10% reinvested into the youth game, youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Kickoff this morning has nothing to do with anything on this particular coast. You know the saga of Joao Cancelo? And this is from our friends at The Guardian. Joao Cancelo, who was a key to Manchester City's success in recent years, he has accused Manchester City of being ungrateful and claimed that lies were told, in direct quotes, about in space, direct space, quotes, space, close quote, about his exit from the club. Portugal fullbacks on a season-long loan at Barca after a spell at Bayern in the second half of last year. Remember, he was a key part of Pep's squad and before his uh, deadline departure for Germany in January of 23, so a little over a year ago. Stories later emerged from our friends at The Guardian that Cancelo, who had fallen behind Rico Lewis and Nathan Ake in the pecking order, had been a disruptive influence in the dressing room. And so he told, meaning he, uh, Joao Cancelo, to perhaps, oh, I don't know, get our pronouns in the right place. Cancelo told the Portuguese newspaper Abola, quote, lies were told. I don't think he necessarily had his finger raised to the, you know, to the sky or anything like that to make that happen. But lies were told. I was never a bad companion for them. And you can ask either Ake or Rico. I don't have any superiority or inferiority complex towards them. I guess this means he just has a complex. I don't know. I think Manchester City were a bit ungrateful to me when they said that because I was a very important player in the years I was there, I never failed in my commitment to the club, to the fans. I always gave everything in quote. So lies were told. I remember a time when I was robbed and attacked that the next day I was playing at the Emirates against Arsenal. These are things you don't forget. I left my wife and daughter alone at home. Terrified people will only remember this because Mr. Guardiola has much more strength than me 
when he says something and I prefer to keep to myself. So lies were told. And I, you know, I feel like at that point we should sit there and go, lies were told, and we should raise our fingers up in the air because you know, that was the only thing that was missing in this entire ordeal. Lies were told, I say. So there you go. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on Joao Cancelo and that particular uh, rundown. For his thoughts about his time at Manchester City, where apparently lies were told, and we all need to sit there and we need to go like, whoop. You know, we need to put our fingers in the air, much like someone who does care. And we'll do it that way. Uh, then the other part uh, of the discussion that uh, I wanted to have for opening kickoff this morning, we had an important anniversary yesterday. And it was 40 years ago today, and it has nothing to do with Sergeant Pepper and a band to play. And this is a question that has truly bothered me for 40 years. It really has. And for, for those of you who just want to know how much I have been truly and totally bothered, I always have wanted to know if the individuals who had to spend an entire Saturday in detention at Shermer High School, did they ever really get lunch? I'm just asking. Because we never, we, we saw them kind of like throw, we put, I saw things put on the tables 40 years ago at Shermer High School. They were waiting for that moment. But did they actually get to finish lunch? They're running around the halls, trying to stay away from, you know, the principal that was there that really was more focused on Mr. Tierney and his personnel file. I've always wondered. If the brain, the athlete, the basket case, the princess, and the criminal ever got the chance to eat their lunch. 40 years ago, the Breakfast Club released at the theater. But we never got to see if those five got to have lunch. Just curious. Unless I missed something in the movie and we had a time jump and we have to assume things. But that was just me. It was a question that I had in my brain. That's your opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. KickoffCoffeeCO.com. That's your QR code for those of you who are watching on the 280 character app on the Twitch and on the uh, YouTube channel. Once again, thanks for hanging out with us as you always do. Don't forget to use the code soccer down here 15 to get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10% reinvested into the youth game, youth initiatives. Brought And uh, thanks once again to our friends at Kickoff Coffee and KickoffCoffeeCO.com. All right, I filibustered. I, I tried to get I tried to get it to 9.15, but I think I'm going to go two minutes early because Abe is already here. Abe is here. Jared is here. Maddie is on the ones and twos. She's lurking in the background. And so, uh, Abe, good morning. And you're, wow, you're, are, now, that, that's, not your, that's not your living room, though. That, that's not your living room. You are physically at the studios, correct? Yeah, today I'm I'm at work at the studios. Uh, they did eat, by the way, in Breakfast Club. Uh, just a, you know, a classic uh, pixie stick and Captain Crunch sandwich. They they do have a couple of shots of them taking that down. So, oh, I was, but it's, it's like, but did they finish? That was my question. It's like we saw we saw Ali Sheedy's character start with the pixie stick sandwich, but we didn't get, we get to see them finish though. That was my question. I mean, if they eat anywhere nearly as quick as I do, it was probably in between takes. It was all gone, and and then. They, they have to redo it. But, yeah, I, I think they got it down. I think they got it down. Okay, just checking because that, was, that is something that has bugged me for 40 years. Did they get to finish lunch instead of being, you know, chasing around the school and trying to figure out, you know, how to get around uh, Dick? So uh, that was, that. like I said, it was just one of those things that bugged me on a weekend. But, you know, Shermer High, woo. Uh, all right, so Jarrett's here. Abe is here. We're going to break down Atlanta United for anything that's on uh, Abe's mind. And I know that – Going in in the pregame show with you and Garrett in, in warmer climes than what Mike and Jason were in, and you have the pictures to prove it. Uh, you were not a, you were not all that optimistic about a result, and by the end of it, obviously, you know Toronto gets full points, and they have some things that they have to worry about too with Lorenzo and Signe. But now that you've had a couple of days to kind of let things ruminate and sit, what are your takeaways from the Atlanta United loss on the road? Yeah, it, it feels kind of odd because I am relatively opti- 
I'm actually normally pessimistic about most teams, but somehow that gets flipped for Atlanta United normally. But we've now had two games where I was projecting a situation where I was like, it's going to be incredibly difficult for them to get points. And look, they're going to go on the road most of the time this season. I'm going to say, I think they can at least get a draw. Uh, I, I just didn't see that against Columbus. You know, they're getting their rings. They're celebrating cruise miss, all that stuff. Opening game. You, you, Almada hadn't been with the team. All this stuff working against them. And then the second road game, right? And, and now you're going up to Toronto in the same situation to an extent. There's just so many things working against them. I just going to be incredibly tough. And I know Toronto was down almost as many players, although many of them due to injury and not uh, international duty, which I think is a different discussion to begin with anyways. But, I mean, you're you're talking about you're missing well, what I – we said it safely, like two of the 15 best players in the MLS between Yakamakis and Almada – um, and, and quite frankly, it's the entire spine of your team. It, it's the entire middle with Gregerson and Schleich and Almada uh, and Gigi. And, and, and so it was just going to be incredibly difficult for, for them to go on the road in that environment and, and get points. You know, we can have the discussion another day about whether the MLS needs to take a more serious look at, at halting action during these international call up windows, stuff like that. But yeah, unfortunately, I was not optimistic, and uh, it, it proved to be true. I don't think they played a, a horrifically bad game. I know the stats maybe say otherwise. It was a very ugly game from a statistical perspective in terms of shots, shots on goal, XG, which is a nonsense stat anyways, um, <laughs> and stuff like that. But I, I do think we had some decent performances from guys we wanted to get a look at. Uh, specifically, I think Noah Cobb did okay. Uh, you know, we're talking about you know, uh, this coming game and, and when is Cobb, is he going to get more playing time? I, I thought he did okay. I, look, he wasn't pristine. He wasn't Steon Gregerson. But compared to what he showed us last season to now this season, uh, a pretty big step forward for him in his development in his career. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what sort of decisions are made from, from Pineda in terms of his future. Jarrett, go for it. Yeah, so when we talk about guys like Cobb, and this is a thing we talk about in every sport, and especially in football, where especially like linemen, for instance, where those mistakes are so glaring, you know, how hard is it sometimes to to kind of grin and bear it and like, hey, these kids are going to have to play. They're going to make mistakes. Yes, they are, but you're going to have to just roll with it and to, to just kind of to just kind of face the fact that you're going to have to roll with those uh, those kids sometimes, even though they're going to make mistakes. Yeah, I, I mean, I know this is like Captain Hindsight stuff, but for me, the key isn't making the mistake. The key is then learning from the mistake and growing and becoming a different player. I thought on their first goal from Toronto that Noah Cobb had an opportunity to go to ground, slide, and tap that ball away. Uh, and I think he hesitated, and, and then the ball gets through, and then they put one on net. Um I think that's something you look at and say, hey, you got to play with your instincts, man. You can't play thinking about this or that. I, I, and I, I really do feel like in a future game, that goal doesn't get scored because Cobb does slide, does tap the ball away. And you get nervous, right? Anytime you're going to ground inside the box, it's a nervy situation, especially for a young guy, especially because so many people put so much on what happened to him a year ago uh, in that 6-1 defeat. And so – you know, I, I think it's important that they break down the film in, in which I, I'm not like the biggest fan of like specific film in soccer. Like, I think it makes sense more in football. Uh, you could specifically see individual play by play. But it, it, I think it's important that they look at the tape and say, hey, man, this was an opportunity for you to make a play here. And you hesitate. Why did you hesitate in, in, in the future? Grow and learn. And, and so, yes. These young guys are going to make mistakes, whether it's Firmino, whether it's Cobb, uh, up top, TRA, as he looks to fill in, uh, even Tyler Wolf, uh, who, whoever it may be, they're going to make mistakes, but they need to improve because they made mistakes. They need to grow and learn from those experiences. I think that's how you get better. I, I actually do think that was a pretty decent step forward for Cobb, uh, even in a loss the other day. Now, for the, the veterans that were there that were a part of the discussion, one of the guys that I wanted to get your your thoughts on, and Jared, you as well, is Saba Lobjanidze. And Saba, 
with a full training camp, obviously coming in in the summer window last year, gets that full training camp, has gone brunette. He's going to cut the emo tracks on an album. It's going to might be a little darker than it would have been last year. But Saba, once again, on both sides of the ball, continues to impress so far early season, early returns for what we're seeing out of him on the right-hand side. Uh, I'd love to know his mileage on – uh, on, on any given weekend, Saba's putting the miles in offensively and defensively once again. Really like what I'm seeing so far out of Saba here in 24. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I was a little disappointed in Saba against Toronto. And it's not necessarily his fault. He's asked to play a certain role. But when you have Almada and Yakamakis out, I, I'm not relying on Firmino and TRA to step in and find the goals for your team. I, I think that... Saba as probably your third biggest weapon. I think he's got to find ways and he's got to be a little bit selfish and he's got to step up. And I know they kept him on the outside. They moved him more central later in the match due to some substitutions, but I need him to be goal hunting. And if his defensive capacity has to suffer because of it, then so be it. But I was looking for him to be a little bit more havoc causing on, on Saturday night. So I was a little bit disappointed just just personally, because I thought if you were going to score, it was going to come from him. And obviously you didn't, and and it didn't. Um, but I, I think of all the guys whose roles change when Almada and Yakamakis are out, it probably needs to be him because he needs to be the big threat. If goals come from the middle or they come from the left side, so be it. And we can have that Shande Silva, Tyler Wolf discussion as well. Right. Um, but I, I need him to step up and be that big threat, and, and he just wasn't. Uh, a couple of moments, sure, and, and then again, I thought he needed to be more, a little bit more self. I'm gonna always gonna want guys to just be selfish and <laughs> rip shot. Look, well, are you talking about ripping shot? Like we saw what like not necessarily great idea shots did for the U.S. national team last night. Like you hit two crackers. What are you gonna do? Like put it on net. Like see what happens. And obviously, he looked like he missed hit. The one in the second half, it kind of dribbled and bounced a little bit. Uh, and so it, it was right there. I mean, that half volley was very close to finding net. And so I want to see more of that. I want to see him running in at net, not necessarily looking uh, to pass it to someone else. But, um, yeah, I, I thought of all the guys whose role needed to change mentally, it's probably him. And if the defense suffers a little bit because of it, I'm willing to live with that, especially on the side where you already have Brooks Lennon uh there with, with a ton of experience to fill in um you know I, I just wanted him to be a little bit more dangerous that's all all right Jared, go for it abe i'm gonna grant your wish right now we're gonna pretend like you only watched one game this week uh, <laughs> so um how just how what degree of hell is mexico in at any Ooh. given moment because this is seven straight that they have lost to the united states and I, I, like I said last night, to anybody who wants to question or qual- put qualifiers on it, were you not alive over the last 20 plus years? Because there's nothing you can do or say that will make me not enjoy every moment of watching Mexico flounder. Yeah. And, and the problem for them is like, what are the opportunities for them to get a little get back? Like, let's say US and, and Mexico meet up in the Olympics. Like, It's not the same. It's a U23 tournament. None of the Youth World Cups are going to matter in terms of that mindset. It it, it really is something where they, they, even if they perform well on their own at the World Cup, they're not winning it. So whatever. And and, and then they somehow, well, I mean, because look, I I, I don't, I don't think like advancing further than the United States is like some great cap in your, uh, you know, feather in your cap. It's a moral victory, eh? Yeah, like that. If you can't win heads up, then like, so like, cause then we, we get in, like we're in March Madness, right? You always talk about like, well, look who they beat. What was their road to the whatever? It's just not the same. Yeah. I, I mean, it's an absolute nightmare for, for Mexico that I am quite frankly enjoying uh, a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I don't know. Like th- this was not a game I necessarily expected to win last night, just based on their performance uh, in the semifinal, if we're being dead honest. Uh, and, and so for them to take the lead the, the way they did, which is just, I mean, for, for Tyler Adams to come back in and, and that's what he does. Um, and, and also, like, I'm a little surprised that Ochoa, I'll be honest, I thought Ochoa should have gotten to that ball. I don't know if it's a slow reaction. I it wasn't, was 
I thought he was screened because there was one angle that was from behind the net where it looked like uh, on goal number two from Reyna that yeah. he was screened on that one. On the first one, I think that it was, I think you know, he ended up, I think, getting a little bit to it. But once again, when you finally pick it up and you have to react and you're going to your right, you are going to be a little tardy on the response. But Tyler Adams just hit it absolutely blood. Counter Counterpoint. He, Memo's old. True. Like he, he is. He's 74 he, he years has, old. He has lost multiple steps. True. Like, yeah, that's, I did, that's not to take away from Tyler Adams at all. That's a great no, strike. No, no. Look, it's a crazy strike. There's no doubt about it. But it wasn't shoulder height, head height. It, it was not that high. It sh- I feel like he probably should have been able to get to it. And you're right, John. He did get a little touch of two fingers onto it. But, I mean, at that pace, there's just no way. I also felt like the ball didn't wiggle as much as he thought it would. Yeah. And he probably delayed trying to get a little read on it as it was coming through one of the Mexico's players sliding legs and uh i mean it was a crazy hit uh, especially in that sort of game we just don't see that often enough for the u.s uh, so many goals come from inside the box maybe a mucked up play kind of the way that Gio reina's goal came if we're being honest it kind of bounced around a little bit of pinball poor clearance and, and guys there to, i mean when you have tyler adams hitting it for i, I don't know what was that 28 yards 30 yeah. yards out whatever it was uh, that clean, even though it wasn't quite elevated to the point where it's unsavable. Um, I mean, that was a heck of a that was a heck of a kick. So uh, I, it was crazy. Yeah, and when you look at it, you mentioned what Mexico can do for quote unquote revenge. It is an aging team, and it is they are a team that is in the in betweens right now when it comes to their age and experience. Because much like we talk about with the U.S. Women's National Team. You might have waited too late to try to integrate things with the younger players and you're stuck with the older guys and you're waiting for that moment. It's like, OK, when do we start swapping guys out? But then you can't risk swapping guys out because you might end up you know, taking steps further back. And I think they're stuck right now in trying to figure out what to do. And when you get stuck, things like last night continue to happen for you nationally. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the youth movement, and and it all has to be built around developing players not for the Nations League or not for the Gold Cup or even for Copa America. It all has to be about getting your team maximized for whenever the next World Cup is, and, and I agree with you. I think they needed to go youth much earlier, uh, much, much earlier. As soon as they are bounce out of last World Cup, you shouldn't be looking at, all right, What's what are the qual like? You should be able to qualify with a youth movement. You really should, and, and you need to start bringing up young guys. Like like it'll be interesting to see where the U.S. goes after the next World Cup when you do have guys start to age themselves to the back end of their prime stuff like that. And you're like, all right, well, you're kind of in your prime now, but in four years, are you still going to be in your prime? Because it all eventually has to be this team peaking, whatever country it is, for the World Cup. Like like. Just winning Copa, winning the Gold Cup, winning Nations League. It's cool. It's all great stories. But ultimately, it, it boils down to the World Cup. And so, uh, yeah, they, they need to figure that out because they're not going to have enough time now to, to necessarily go youth movement before the next World Cup. So now they're, what, six years? They're on a six-year youth movement. I mean, guys, are, it's just so tough to develop that far out. But I, I'm, I'm always in favor of, all right, if you're – if, if you're here now, like, where are you going to be in four years? Where are you going to be in three years when the next World Cup rolls around? They should have had the 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds um, a lot more invested into this program, including at the goalkeeper position, as as Jared mentioned. It just it felt like that was a, 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 a younger man's save, and Ochoa just couldn't get there. Matty Cruz on the ones and twos is parachuted in. Matty, what's on your mind? Well, first of all, a David, I'm offended. I have seen the Breakfast Club. <laughs> don't get it, don't get it wrong. I'm gonna get some soda. You guys talk. Listen, my 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 parents were not monsters. They I watched it. It was really good. I also watched Sixteen Candles. Love Sixteen Candles. Very good movie. Anyway, I'm gonna quote um, a little thing from John Green. Twelve thousand years from now, or when our civilization is a distant memory, and there's a patch of synthetic leather buried deep under the millennia of sediment. There's a little piece of rotten plastic that will still remember being kicked by Tyler Adams. Because, whoa, that goal literally took me out. I just, I think the overall performance of how we looked against Jamaica to then Mexico, it looked so different. 
And I, I don't know if it was because we were rising to the occasion because it's always Mexico that always, you know, it's that fired up. True. But, you know, it, it's, it's strange. You know, you go against a team like Jamaica, you have that performance, and then you come into a team like Mexico, you've got to learn from the mistakes. And I actually think that for, like, the, that Greg Berhalter and the whole squad did a very good job of adapting to that. Well, I mean, Abe, at least with uh, with Jamaica, you weren't playing Iceland part two. No, I, I do think there was probably a mindset there um, against Jamaica that was a little bit look ahead if we're being honest. And I think you – I don't know about you. Like, I feel like when you look at CONCACAF and you look at who's dangerous, especially depending on where the game is being held, there was a previous regime in Jamaica that felt a lot more dangerous than the team now. Um I think Canada is a team that screams danger to you now when they're healthy, uh, that in previous eras, maybe they didn't. And then obviously Mexico, uh, home or away. And I mean, you, who decided to play that in Dallas? It may as well be an away game at that point. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think there was definitely like a lack of focus uh, against Jamaica, which probably the fact that you were able to somehow – survived that probably not only refocused you but doubled down on that focus and and I think there was much more focus last night probably than we've seen in quite a while uh from the men's national team and, and yeah like when you try and like go there's there's been some incredible goals for the United States but most of those are probably more because of a situation than necessarily the pure quality and pure class of a strike. Uh, I, I mean, there's a couple of, you know, the Dempsey is hit that I can think of stuff like that, but there, there's not many that are going to top the, the just pure quality and class of what Tyler Adams did uh, last night. All right. Last question for you before you go. And since I know you're at colony square, that means that you're kind of busy uh, get right game Easter Sunday, Chicago comes to town, Atlanta United. Once again, the chance to get full points at home and another one that they need to take care of. Yeah, I'm interested to see who's back in the lineup, uh, who's playing uh, as we wrap up the international call-ups, uh, who's going to be available for 60, who's available for 75, who's available full 90. But quite frankly, you're at home. You're undefeated at home this year. You've had some very strong performances, including last week out a, a clean sheet, uh, or, or you know when they last were at home, a clean sheet. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, you're better. You're just better than Chicago. And so this is a situation where I do expect you to come home. Whatever the lineup is, I do think you'll get a couple pieces back. Certainly not all. I would assume Gregerson is still out uh, with that meniscus injury. But th this is an opportunity, as you said, to to reestablish yourself and, and pull home the full three points. And I, I do think they will do that. Uh, I, I think the crowd's going to be fully supportive, as it always is at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. There's There's – you had excuses in Toronto on the road. Whoever's in the lineup, there's no excuse for for not being able to beat uh, Chicago. So I, I, I'm I'm pretty optimistic. We're back. We're back on that side of things. Uh, luckily for me, this week for Atlanta United, no doubt. As always, at Abe Gordon on the Twitter is at nine two nine. The game, the pre and the post with you and Garrett Chapman. And at some point, sir, no offense, but I am anticipating that you will be outside doing a show if not both shows because of the picture that you had in the climate controlled surroundings in colony square and mike and jason were in like 20 degree weather i'm fully anticipating a moment sometime well the good news is if we're doing the shows outside it's probably somewhere near mercedes-benz stadium as we know <laughs> the weather here in atlanta not quite as devastating as what they were dealing with uh up there in toronto it could get cold towards the back end of the season uh, who knows what part of the faux uh, seasonal wheel we're at right now so uh, but bring it on. The difference is I, I am always dressed for 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 the setup. I mean, you, when you have a dog like I do, you're checking the weather app and the radar like every 15 minutes to try and find those windows of, well, you know, whatever that you need to walk the dog. So I'm yeah. I'm, I'm always ready, whatever the occasion is temperature wise. No doubt about it, brother. As always, great to have you on on Mondays. Be safe. We'll catch up with you again. Actually, we'll see you Easter Sunday for those of us that wander inside Mercedes-Benz, and we will hear you a week from today. Thanks, as always, for hanging out on Mondays. Yeah, look forward. Hoping to uh, talk about three points next time instead of zero. You got it, brother. Thanks again. That's Abe, and uh, Abe is going to go get breakfast. I forgot to ask him what his mug was this week. I am slipping, man. I, I am just absolutely slipping on what his mugs are. Uh Traditionally, when folks come to visit, I always want to know what the coffee mug is. Uh, 
you know, I, because of what happened with uh, Atlanta United, let me run through the numbers really quickly. I know that a lot of folks are focused on Dosa Cero, as you should. And basically, at this point, I'm just going to sit there. Once we get through the numbers, whenever Bart wants to join, he can join. Because I imagine we'll be talking about it a whole lot when it comes to uh, what we saw. Uh, your starting lineup in the matchup, it was Brad and Nett. You had Ronald, Derek, and Noah Cobb to go with Brooks Lennon at the back. And everybody, Brooks punched a 7.5, by the way, on the day. Uh, your midfield, no surprise. Dax McCarty, Tristan Muyumba. Muyumba had north of a seven on Sofa Score. Tyler Wolf was uh, a part of it as well. They had, and Sofa Score has it mixed up. Apple had it mixed up in the graphic. Sofa Score's got it mixed up in the graphic. They have it. They have Atlanta United in a three-four-three, which was not entirely correct. Traditionally, it's a four-three-three. But back line of Ronald, Derek, Noah, and Brooks. Brooks had a seven point five. Midfield, Nicholas Firmino taking over in the ten roll. He had a seven. Tristan Nguyenba had a 7, Dax as your 6 at a 6.5 up top. Tyler, Saba, and Jamal Tiare all in the mid-sixes. And your substitutions on the day for Atlanta United. Uh, Shande Silva, Edwin Mosqueda, Daniel Rios, who came in and gave you 15 minutes. So once again, the, the, the Edwin Mosqueda philosophy of somebody with fresh legs and you try to get him integrated, just like, dude, go run, see what you can come up with. And Derek Etienne Jr. came in for a cup of coffee for uh, Sabalov Janidze. And everybody had sixes on the board. Your stats on the day. For uh, Atlanta United, it was 54-46 in possession. 20 total shots for Toronto. Nine on target. Eight total shots for Atlanta. Three on target, which meant nine were off target. All three off target for Atlanta. Two blocks on each side. Each side had seven corners. One offside flag raised on each. Toronto had 14 fouls compared to eight for Atlanta United and uh, throw ins 25 to 13 goal kicks, 14, six big chances. And this is all in uh, the, on the side of Toronto. No real surprise, big chance five for a Toronto. They missed on four. They hit the woodwork once two counterattacks, two counterattack shots, 13 shots inside the box, seven outside Atlanta had seven inside one outside. Brad had seven saves on the day. Preventing goals, a new statistic from our friends at SofaScore, a .94. Atlanta passed at 83% accurate. Toronto passed at 84. Long balls, 31 out of 67 for a 46%. Toronto had 36 out of 60 uh, for 60%. Six crosses each. Atlanta United had that on one less attempt. Seven dribbles and 54% success rate compared to 15 to 32 for Toronto. Duels won, basically it was 50.1% to 49 point, uh, the 49.9, 50 out, 55 out of 109. And aerial duels, 17 out of the 27 won by Toronto. 24 tackles for Atlanta United compared to 14 for Toronto. 10 picks for Toronto compared to 7. 19 clearances compared to 12. Jarrett, now that we've had a couple of days to kind of look at things, what else is stuck in your mind about uh, Atlanta United and Toronto? So you're missing a lot of people. Um it's a tough game just because Toronto has been tough to play this year. They've been kind of, they've been scrappy. John Herdman's got them playing together and what they lack in raw talent. They're making up for in cohesiveness right now. Um, Look, the weather wasn't great, but as we have seen through many games this year and in previous years, when you have a, an adverse condition game, one team's going to handle it better than the other. And Toronto handled that better than Atlanta. Both teams created some chances. Um, some quality is – there's a delta in quality between those chances. Um, Toronto takes their snapshot chance in the first half to get their lead going at halftime. Um, you know, if Saab is able to wrap his foot around that that volley coming through the box, you know, maybe we're having a different conversation. But, again, if Frogs had wings, they wouldn't bump their ass when they jump. Correct. Um yeah, you just you didn't and in the second half. I mean, look, it's windy, it's cold, it's miserable, but Toronto coped with it better. And you have to tip your hat to them for doing that. Yes, you're missing guys. Um you want to see what some of the rotated squad can give you. But man, it's um it's it's tough because this one you're gonna want. I think it's one you I think it's one you do want to do again if you have a chance because you feel like you can do better with it. You can do better with the few chances you created. Um, but you also kind of have to get ready for this week now. 
and they said it's tough. I mean, because the weather, yeah, the weather was tough. It wasn't super rainy. It wasn't super like snowy, but it's cold. The the wind. Go look at the the corner kicks. Both oh. teams are hitting oh. on the left side. I mean, that ball is just hanging up mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. But Toronto coped with it better, and you give them their flowers for that. Yeah. You they yeah. had those moments where they got it right. Um, I think you could give a special shout though to. Uh, I think you give a special shout to Brad Guzan, though, for this mm-hmm. game. Because, man, Guz made some damn saves. Both goalkeeper, both goalkeepers for Atlanta did this week because John Burner for the twos was uh, was going to hang on to that clean sheet for dear life. <laughs> yeah, he was. But, man, Brad Guzan, I mean, look, the second goal happens because Brad makes a great save going low to his right. It's a bad height for him. He gets down. He makes it. He tries to push it away. You just have somebody there on the back post who's able to tap it in and your defense doesn't react quickly enough slash it doesn't fall fortuitously to one of them instead. Yeah, Um, yeah, man, Brad was really good in that game. (laughs) Uh, He seemed like he was really pissing off Bernadeschi at the end of the game because he just wouldn't let him score. I was really happy with what Brad's given you. And look, we are 18 months, give or take, from his Achilles injury. Yeah. And I've really been impressed with him so far this year. And I think a lot of it is you're you are more than a year on from that injury, and I know Brad is very much long in the tooth. Um, as far as goalkeepers go, and as far as MLS players go by age, I think he's been outstanding this year because you brought in a guy to challenge him, and he has risen to that challenge, and in some cases gone above that challenge. And I, you get you 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 give him a pat on the back, you give him the warmest seat on the bus with the seat warmer turned on mm-hmm. at the end of that game. Because he was outstanding. Now you have to compartmentalize that and you have to go beat Chicago. I talked about the games you won were games you had to win because you were at home against teams that were exhausted. Um, A little bit to Abe's point, this is one where it sucks. And it's it's an entirely different conversation we can have. And I feel like we have every year about the way MLS does the international windows and plays through them. And it's tricky. It's, it's, it's tricky for a lot of teams. Um, Toronto less so just because there's such a unique situation where um, Insigne and Bernadeschi aren't getting called into the Italian national team. So they're keeping their heavy hitters, mm-hmm. uh, which is very fortuitous for them. You know, yeah. if you're I mean, them, you, you, lose, know, that's, that's, you, lose that's you lose Davey Flores and uh, you're supposed to lose Osorio, but yeah. that, <laughs> that one didn't happen. And it was kind of sketchy the way that <laughs> went down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you lost Osorio. <laughs> no, you didn't. Uh, where like he was supposed to be gone and then he didn't. Yeah, it's like oh, but, it's, but, oh yeah, he's injured. Okay, as, fine. And then you say, and then he stays. He as once, up. as once again, as we talked about, like that's a game. The games Atlanta won were games Atlanta needed to win because of the circumstances. Yeah. I think if you were Toronto, this was a game you needed to win if you were Toronto because yeah. you had a team coming in to rough conditions, missing half their starting lineup, including all their designated players, Mm -hmm. and you were going to have your heavy hitters. This is a game, if you're Toronto, you had to win, and they did. Now Atlanta's going to come up at games like this this year where they're going to have to win Mm -hmm. on the road, and they're just going to have to do it. Or they're going to be a situation where the home team has to win this game and Atlanta's coming to town, and Atlanta's going to have to pull that upset because every team goes through that, and you're going to go through those situations on the road where it's going to be tough and you're going to have to overcome it. We'll see if they, we'll see how they do this year because not every game is going to be a cruise miss and not every game is going to be, uh, you know, forging the Northwest passage, (laughs) trying to find the Pacific ocean, the Donner party through a, through a shipping lane. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not great. Um, but you got to bury it now because you have Chicago coming to town. It's going to be a tricky game. Yeah. I mean, Chicago's got issues at left back. Chase Gasper had to be subbed as a sub in the, the match this weekend. But Tom, it's because Atlanta spends a bunch of money on their roster and they've got guys who are part of international teams. Hell, you had like Sean Greckerson's been a part of the Norwegian national team picture before. Yeah. He wasn't gone. Um, you know, Tyler Wolf had been part of the youth national team setup. Uh, as recently as last year, he wasn't gone. Um, you had man, it like imagine if 
Brooks got called into the U.S. national team picture. Oh, which yeah. Brooks is like he's doing everything he can to get called into the to that national team picture. Like it's something. It could. I feel like it could have been worse. Like imagine if they'd called Saba into Georgia. Yeah, it could have been worse. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, when you spend the money, when you're like spending like this, um, it's just. Mm-hmm. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, that's one of the side effects is you're going to have people disappearing in the window. And then when you play through that window, um, you know, it gets tough and not even just a talent wise, but uh, you know, I think a chemistry wise. Yeah, that's um, true. definitely. definitely. Yeah, I'd love to ask those guys how their feet felt because there's a lot of touches, not even just for Atlanta, for Toronto as well. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of touches in that game where it looked like, it looked like they couldn't feel their feet. Yeah, where like they were miss hitting the strength on the, the 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 power on passes, or even when they were receiving passes, like heavy first touch, thump off the foot, like it's hitting a log. Correct. It, the, I would be very interested to like hear what they say. Like, hey, how do your feet feel? Like, does does Toronto warm the? Do they have warmers under the field? Because some of y'all looked like you couldn't feel your feet. Yeah. When I you know. were receiving the ball, it no was problem. a minor miracle that um. It was a minor miracle that nobody's feet just fell off when the ball hit it. Exactly. Uh, Maddie Cruz, now that you've had a couple days to kind of let uh, Atlanta United and Toronto ruminate, what else is on your mind? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where it's hard to balance because of how, you know, you're missing seven players. You're missing some of your very key players to your squad. Yeah. And it's also like, oh, well, you have all of these young developed players who can do the job and who have done the job in the past. Um, I mean, honestly, just from looking at the match overall, I didn't, I think it was very difficult for us to connect. Like it was very difficult for us to create chances. And when we did, it was miscommunication on the field. No one was really talking to each other or even anything like that. It felt very disjointed to me when I was watching it. And so it it was hard and, you know, it's just, it's difficult to grasp. Um, one thing I don't like, though, is I don't like that. I, I saw somewhere I don't like that people are like trying to pin it all on the players we brought up from the twos because yeah. I'm like I'm like no I'm like no 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 like those players are phenomenal. They are pros. I mean, hence literally Efrain Morales, Matt Edwards, and Luke Brennan all literally playing a full ninety minutes or almost <laughs> yesterday and won four nil. I'm like we have the talent. It was just. It's it's unforeseen circumstances, you know. The weather plays a big factor in it too. Um, I, I I thought it was either going to be a draw or a, or a loss against Toronto, um, but I mean, all, all hats off to Toronto. They played really great. Um, I'm I'm hoping that Insigne uh, gets better though, because that 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 injury it does suck, and I I hope that they get that figured out. Yeah, we don't know what the official word is. It, it looked like he was you know, grabbing his right hamstring. He was having problems leaving the field. And, you know, we don't know right now what the extent of that injury is for uh, for Insigne. We'll keep an eye on that. Bart Keeler joining us top of the hour to break down uh, another dose of Seto. And we got highlights to go through with that. Also yesterday, uh, Atlanta United 2, Maddie mentioned it, and we were all there, and uh, the match is available on our Mixler channel at soccerdownhere.mixler.com. You can go back and listen to the extravaganza that was Atlanta United and the 4 0 win over Carolina Core. Carolina Core had played in the Open Cup in midweek against Bill Hamid. I did not see the match. Uh, I do know it was a five goal thriller, it was a 3 2 final. And uh, I do not Bill know. Bill gave up a really weird deflected goal that was genuinely <laughs> hilarious. Um, I'm shocked. I have I have been uh, I have been like grumpy about Bill Hamid for a long time ever. And this some of this goes back to like the concept. Excuse me, the concept of the GK Union. Yeah, because goalkeepers are very weird human beings. Yes, um, they are. And they there is like a fraternity of goalkeepers and like I've been kind of salty about Bill Hamid since he just publicly s- slammed Guzan yeah. about like I've, I've that that's like in, in a weird situation of being a goalkeeper. That's all that one always bothered me because he just publicly just slammed a fellow goalkeeper, fellow national team goalkeeper. And yes. like it, it didn't help that Bill Hamid never really I'm did anything of- after that. Yeah. Never really did anything after that. Okay. Um, it was very odd. Mm-hmm. It was. And so uh, Carolina Core comes in, and they had had three guys who had played the full 90 in the midweek turn around 
and start for Roy Lassiter in that matchup on uh, and yesterday afternoon up at the Fraction. Luke Brennan had a very busy day. Here's goal number one from the network, courtesy of us, Jason on the call. Surveying his options outside of the foot pass over to Gajardo on the left flank. Gajardo inside to Russo. Russo further inside to Armas, 25 yards from goal. Over to the right to Okello. Patience here from Atlanta United, too. Back to Armas. Armas, short cross, volley in, goal! 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 Atlanta United, too. Luke Brennan. Great phase of play for Atlanta United, too. And the short cross from Javi Armas picks out Brennan, who had looped around to the left side. Doesn't try to go for power from the top of the six. Placement past Sutton, and Atlanta gets on the board first here in Kennesaw. 1-0 to the twos. And, I mean, when you look at that particular goal, Matty, Javi Armas continues to impress, and I've really liked what I've seen with Javi, especially as we got to talk with Steve Cook this week, the relationship that he seems to be forming at times with Matias Gajardo. But Javi Armas, once again, uh, an instigator in a good sense for Atlanta United, too, with the first goal on the board. Oh, absolutely. I think I think Javi is doing a great job in the midfield of like being very good at just like this attacking and placing pressure on the opposing team. But when he does get the ball, he is he gets forward. He's not afraid to also take those shots. He's not afraid to be in the midst of it all and create those chances, which I love. I think he's like he's like a dual like a dual oh gosh, sorry my voice. He's like a dual like knife. Like he can like do both ends. Like it's like it's great. He can be that offensive player when you need it to be, but he also can track back and be very defensive minded as well. And I think he's a very Swiss army knife is the word I was looking there for. There you go. Oh my goodness. I couldn't think of the word. Um, I think, I think that's what he is. And I mean, credit to, you know, I don't want to jump ahead, but I mean, he got that goal on that free kick. I mean, he like, he he's great. He can also do that. He, he's the one that takes our PKs as well. I mean, he's a Swiss army knife. No doubt. All right. Uh, take your sip of bourbon. We'll go through goal number two. Uh, and this one, Jarrett, I, I will maintain as we play the highlight, once again, courtesy of us here at the network with Jason on the call. I'm going to play the goal and basically say, I ain't never seen nothing like this. Edwards drives it across to Gajardo, chests it down. Gajardo in the middle, third in his own half, forward to Okello, back to Gajardo, into the attacking half now. Russo, sliding challenge, a good one from Christian Diaz, Atlanta throw. Russo takes it quickly, too quickly. Didn't get that in. The referee, the AR, they're looking at each other. That shouldn't be still be going. Atlanta takes advantage. Luke Brennan, another goal. Goal, goal, goal. Atlanta United 2. The referees got that one wrong, and we'll see if they correct it here. They're going to allow it. Atlanta United 2 gets the goal. Atlanta tried to take the throw quickly. I'll try to make sense of this. Russo throws it in. It bounces on the outside of the field and then goes in. Atlanta keeps playing because there's no whistle. And Atlanta United 2 gets the goal. A second from Brennan. 2-0. The referee kept looking back at the AR on the near side. The ball bounced outside of the field of play. I don't think I've ever seen that. Nope. I ain't never seen it. Jarrett, have you ever seen it? No, it was incorrect. Uh, yeah. That's the bottom line. Like, look, Atlanta took advantage of it. And um, Atlanta were better on the day. The twos were better on the day. Yes. Um, still incorrect. But yes. you, it's one of those where you play you play to the whistle. Um yeah, man, they took advantage. They made it happen. It was very, um, it was very weird. Mm-hmm. Luke Brennan scored two very weird goals in this game, but I, I think like the second one I, for me was more impressive in the sense that, like, the first one he's like he's trying to get placement on that ball coming in from that early cross, but the second one is that ball is kind of bouncing in the box. He creates a half of inch of space for himself, and then he doesn't try and rip it, but he kind of gets it on the half volley, gets his, gets his body over it, 
and then just drives it, but gets the technique right so that there's still some force behind it and puts in the side netting. And it's, it's, it's great technique from Luke Brennan. Yeah, cool hand Luke with a brace, his first two on the season, and that made it 2-0. Atlanta United 2 was not done in the first half. The pre-mentioned uh, Javier Armas from about 20, goal number three here on the SDH Network. Armas and Gajardo standing over it. Whistle blown. Four-man wall for Carolina. Armas. Goal! 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 Javier Armas! Free kick golazo from Javi. 3 0 Atlanta United 2. Free kick Javi made it 3 0 and, and uh, we're in 86. I, I'm just, I'm digging the high, I'm digging the high numbers. I really am. But uh, Maddie, you mentioned Javi. Javi puts it in the back of the net once again. His second goal of the season. So now he and uh, he and Brennan each have two on the year. But we get to see imagination come in a bunch of different forms. And in this particular case with Javi Armas, it came from a set piece. Yeah, and you know, it's really interesting. I haven't had the chance to talk to um, Coach Cook about, like, I, I was, I've been meaning to ask him, so I'll definitely try to get that information. But, I mean, I think it's interesting that Javi Armas is the one that's taking the PKs, if anything happens with that, Yeah, like we saw in the last match against Orlando City B. And he's also taking those free kicks in that position. And so it's it's interesting. I definitely want to ask like how that kind of came to be and how he's the one who's decided to do that. I think it's great. I think there's a reason that he's taken them because they've both led to goals. <laughs> um, but I, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I think he's a really, really good addition to this squad. And I think he's going to get really, really good as it goes on. Even if he does put butter in his coffee. 3-0 at the break and one more goal on the board for Atlanta United 2. Jason mentioned Stephen Herlock. And literally it took a minute and a half from the first mention of Stephen Herlock for goal number four to happen. Stephen Herlock in the middle of it, Kareem Tamimi, the last goal on the board for the twos on the network yesterday. Thrown into Armas. Armas out wide to Centeno. Atlanta in their own half. Gajardo, Armas, Centeno. Back to Edwards. Trio becomes a quartet. Now Burner, top of the six. Plays it up the right side to Gajardo. Takes it down out of the air skillfully. Looking for Herlock down the right side. Finds him. Herlock in behind. Here comes Herlock into the 18. Herlock slides it across. Slot it home. Goal! 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 Karim Tamimi. The assist from Herlock. Barely into the game. And Herlock makes something happen for Atlanta United 2. Second goal of the year for Tamimi. First assist at this level for Herlock, and it's 4-0 Atlanta United 2. So the question is, with Cool Hand Luke with two, Armas with two, Tamimi with two, Kefsi with the question of the morning. To butter or not to butter? Equal goal production. Jarrett, to butter or not to butter? No, I don't like coffee, so I don't care. There you go. Well, I'm right there with you. Maddie, to butter or not to butter? That is the question. Uh, Not to butter. I just don't know. No. <laughs> uh, so then now, Hutch, with the excellent question, do we call Javi Armas Agent 86? I like Ooh, that. I like, I like that. that, too. I like that. Hutch reminds us that 86 was a Maxwell, Smart, uh, Maxwell Smart's spy number. Missed it by that much. I'm going to have to get that dropped now. Uh, anything involving Maxwell Smart. So we're going to have to call Javi Armas Agent 86, I think, until further notice. Uh, but, yeah, I think KFC here on the show at least, I don't know about the Twitch pitch, and the Twitch pitch can can uh, respond as they wish. But it appears that uh, not to butter, that that is the answer to the question when it comes to equal goal production. Because unless Kareem Tamimi puts butter in his coffee that he's learned from Agent 86, and... You know, folks have taken to this. I know that Dax McCarty hasn't taken to it, but we do know that this is, you know, part and parcel to to Javi's. This might, this is, uh, you know, th this is not uh, any kind of kryptonite for Javi Armas. So, two goals for Brennan, two goals for Timmy, two goals for Javi Armas. Four of those six goals, I believe, do not have butter in their coffee. So we'll keep uh, keep that in mind. Uh, it is hour number two, and uh, wasting no time. Uh, yes, the yes, Michael, that is correct. Uh, the answer is no, no, no butter in your coffee. 
Uh, like I said, wasting no time. We'll bring in Bart for the fatal four way. Uh, Bart, do you have, first off, what is your mug, sir? Uh, drink coffee, do good. Okay. So it is drink coffee, do good. Is there any butter in your mug, sir, to go with your coffee? No, today is a, uh, coconut almond creamer. Okay. All right. So, uh, it, it seems that Javi Armas is in the minority when it comes to putting butter in his coffee. Hey, if it works for Javi Armas, it works for Javi Armas, but folks uh, just don't seem to be all that fired up about having butter in their coffee. Um, you know, I think people can put what they want in their coffee as long as it makes them a better person. Um, clearly, the Mexico fans did not do that last night. Yeah, okay, so we'll get into that. We, we will get into that discussion uh, after we get through the, the goals in and of themselves. Uh, first off... From 30,000 feet, now that you've had the sum total of a whole 10 hours to digest what happened last night, or maybe 11, uh, once again, another hashtag, another dose of Cero, another Nations League for the USMNT. So now that you've had a whole you know, bedtime plus a couple of hours to digest it, what's gone through your mind? Uh, well, I think the first thing is you have to give the team props for the way that they came out from the minute that the whistle blew. I mean, we, we saw a very, uh, I don't even know what the, t the term is to describe how they came out against Jamaica. Cause they were just flat. They were just, uh, they felt like, Oh, we're, we got this, I guess. Well, um, and I would all, but I would also posit with Jamaica when you have turned yourself into the Caribbean version of Iceland, you're going to bore people to tears anyway with Heimer Hogramson. Yeah. Well, but the, the game wasn't, they didn't start well that game and this game they started from the from the jump they were keyed up ready to go and i think that was really the key for the whole game was the us was ready to battle but also not concerned with all the shenanigans um mexico is trying to pull with you know i mean edson alvarez i feel like he and the referee talked more than probably most men and their wives talked throughout an entire calendar year last night it was it was a ongoing conversation that he had to keep going with his best new best friend drew fisher <laughs> and you know, I think the the U.S. didn't really get involved in that. Um, they were focused. They knew what the goal was, and the goal was to to win, uh, which is something that Mexico hasn't been able to do in, a, you know, what, seven times now they haven't been able to beat the U.S. And that, to me, is the difference, is being focused and plugged in from the, from the start, um, which, again, we didn't see that against Jamaica. They came back, and obviously this team seems to get fired up for the Mexico match, which is great. Um, and you saw that a team that is focused, that is determined, that is not going to be, you know, put off by shenanigans, by conversations, by fouls, by even, you know, fans throwing stuff on them after they take a 2-0 lead and fans saying things, shouting things they shouldn't and having to have two stoppages in, uh, you know, by the time that we hit stoppage time this team was not deterred and that's a credit to all 23 players on this roster um, and the coaching staff to get them ready all right so let's run through the goals first goal once again courtesy of our friends at cbs sports and Concacaf, and probably the best way to describe it is this that's an absolute banger jess is not wrong <laughs> adams puts his foot through the middle of this one nobody closing him down nobody expecting him to shoot nobody thinking Tyler Adams had this one in his bag and what an absolute banger this play almost looks like it's just going to continue right here. They're going to work this ball around. Tyler Adams, nobody closing him, has one thing on his mind, and oh my, does he get through the middle of it to put the U.S. up 1-0. Tyler Adams is back. 
hadn't started for the U.S. in 475 days and produces that. Chris Whittingham, Tony Miola on the call on a Paramount Plus CBS Sports and our friends from CONCACAF. See, now, this is what happens when you, you let people sit there and give you the right lead in because it was. That's an absolute banger. And you had uh, Whittingham and Miola mention it, I think, a good solid three times. They were just listening to Jess. That's the bottom line here. <laughs> now, the, now, looking at the replay, the precision, well, first and foremost, he hit it about as purely as you possibly could. Mexico gave him entirely too much mm-hmm. room and too much time to set up the shot from 30. Then you have it go through the scissored legs of a defender on the way there. And it gets past Memo Ochoa for 1-0. Tyler Adams, minutes restriction. I'm hoping Andoni Iraola was not mad. Mm -hmm. The number of minutes that uh, Greg Berhalter played him this weekend. But Tyler Adams came out strong and hit an absolute rocket for the first goal of the match. Well, and it was a good uh, example of kind of recycling a set-piece opportunity. And that's something that this U.S. team still needs to improve on is maximizing set-piece opportunities. This was one where, you know, I mean, the, the the play that ends up getting Tyler the goal, Tim Ream is on the left side because he's been pushed up um, from the set piece and passes it backwards just to kind of recycle possession. But he's playing basically as a left winger. And that kind of ability to reset and still utilize the momentum you have from a set piece is important, um, especially if you're going to play teams like, you know, Uruguay or better the summer you're going to have to stay locked in stay uh keep the momentum from those types of uh, advantages that you're creating through set pieces and will with probably one of the better comments of the morning across the board that i've seen jeff collins still had zero losses at georgia tech the last time mexico beat the united states so yeah, well, man wins. Well, Mexico's the- gone through about as many coaches as I feel like Georgia Tech has gone through. <laughs> time, so. No doubt. Uh, so it's one nil at that point. And uh, Will, with the geographic correction, it was from Denton, not Arlington. It was from it was from the far western section of yeah. central of the Metroplex. It was that far. Yeah, north. that was that was definitely. I mean, at least Fort Worth. You know, that was yes. that was from way back. Uh, yeah. And and I think you know I think Mexico didn't expect that from Tyler. No, we didn't. That's for sure. Uh, we, I mean, we've seen him take shots like these before, but like they definitely were not saying, oh, we need to go out and step to this, you know, guy who's uh, <laughs> yeah played a grand total of like an hour of soccer in the past five years, it feels like. So. Yeah, no doubt. And it was right at the end of the first half. And so you've got that momentum to carry you into the locker room. Mexico has things to think about. And uh, then the other guy who hasn't played a whole lot of minutes for his club team, but uh, is more than happy to be put in the lineup by his national team. In uh, the second half, gets goal number two to create the hashtag all over again. Once again, courtesy of our friends at Paramount Plus, CBS Sports, and CONCACAF. Chris Whittingham, Tony Miola on the call. The byline. Oh, it's cheeky across the area, and it's off the break and headed away. Only as far as Gio Reyna! Dos a cero! Gio Reyna! And so there you go. Once again, two on the board for the United States. They would go on to win it 2-0. And before we get into the the latter stages shenanigans and all of that discussion, because, yes, once again, we have to discuss it, but for the reason of the chant being brought out, not because of what it traditionally is attached to. There is something else that's attached to it now when it comes to uh, the weaponizing of that particular chant. But Gio Reyna, who... With the minutes that he played, once he cleared minute number, once he cleared the 84th minute of the Jamaica match, he has played, he had played more minutes for his national team than he has for his current club team in the entire time that he's been at Nottingham mm-hmm. Forest. Doing well under Greg Berhalter in the USMNT. Well, you know, I think there's been a lot of conversation around Geo, uh, rightfully so, for a lot of things that geo can control and a lot of things that geo can't control. Correct. And you know, the, the, the discussion has always been 
uh, or was at least before this tournament and seems to be almost every time Gio comes into camp is how, how many minutes can he give you? How fit is he actually all these things? And, you know, I think there is a reason why he didn't start the Jamaica game. I truly do it. it I'm not saying that he's unfit. It's just, it, I, I don't understand how a fully fit Gio Reyna would not be your starter, right? That's, and I don't think that Greg Berhalter is that stupid of a coach to not start your best attacking player if he's fully fit. So the fact that he was able to be in the lineup tonight is uh, important for the U.S. national team because if he is able to start, you're a better team. If he is on the field, you're a better team. He makes coaches look great. He makes other players look great. He makes defenders look foolish. He makes a aging Memo Ochoa look like he doesn't know how to play goalkeeper again. <laughs> and he really is the difference maker. Yeah. Um, you know, I hate that it seems like we have to have him on the field for us to be any sort of creative attacking threat, but he, if he is fit, has to be the starter. And he proved that again. Um, and that goal was another, like he had a slightly different role last night, which was a little bit deeper. And that seemed, you know, I saw some people on Twitter complaining about that, but you know, I think the goal was to try to get Gio on the ball as much as possible. And you saw that he didn't quite get forward a whole lot, but the couple of times he did, this is one of them, you know, we get a goal out of it. And it was a late arriving run into the box, if you will, you know, not quite the same, but you know, he wasn't in the box when the initial cross from Pooley came in, uh, that kind of gets cleared and he sees an opportunity and bounces on it. And it's nice to see from Gio that he doesn't have to do all the dirty work to score a goal. He was able to just be right there, say, oh, this is mine. I'm taking it. Um, after Pulisic did all the dirty work and cut up a few Mexican defenders and uh, caused the chaos that ensued. Uh, like I said, I do want to get into the Mexican national team as a as a group and the chant late in the match. Uh, but, you know, once again, Gio playing a bit of a deeper role, helping things out defensively and then helping the build up from further back instead of being, you know, frontline Gio where it's like, OK, you know, feed me, feed me, feed me. I'm going to be up here with the rest of the guys. Gio played that deeper role last night and was a part of the build up, which was integral in there. Too. Yeah. I mean, this is one of those things that I think most people have. Like, if you want to actually criticize Greg about tactics, this is a tactical thing that Greg does every single time. And. The fullbacks are pushed really high up the field, which means that your two eights have to come back to help and build up. Um, you know, whether or not you agree with that or not is to be discussed. Um, we saw the flaws of that against Jamaica, but you see how that can help you against a team like Mexico, who is willing to actually kind of come out of their shell, try to press you, try to get, you know, the ball higher up the field. And with Geo able to not just find passes, but beat players on the, dribble which he did a lot last night as well mm -hmm. that does especially again against a team like mexico um it it eliminates those players and now you're running toward goal with a bunch of players coming with you and so that is you know geo's forte is just being able to get by defenders um and you add to that you know a little bit of the weston mckinney factor of um the two of them being able to play slightly different roles than they're not used to for the u.s national team um that's pretty awesome, you know, and it's good versatility to see. And Gio put in a great shift. And, you know, I think, again, it's it's wonderful to see how Gio can play for this national team, especially after where uh, where we were, what, 18 months ago with him. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's nice to see the growth that he has had personally. And, unfortunately, his club situation hasn't improved. And, um Hopefully he can find a way to make that a little bit better this summer. Yeah, if Nuno, if Nuno, if Nuno ain't playing, then something's not right. Uh, Maddie for uh, Bart, go. I know that we've talked about all the good things that came out of that game. I feel like we kind of have to get into the oh, no the doubt stupidity down here that was right. ensued. Yeah, I my question to you, obviously, I know it's a bit different because I don't think you've ever had to deal with this as a ref. But with that being said. You know, you have the steps, the actions taken. You did it. It went on for a little bit. No stoppage. Finally, we got a stoppage. It was a couple minutes. Then they went back to it. Still continued another stoppage. It doesn't seem like this step is working. I mean, what 
like how do we combat it because the only way i can think of is to find the hell out of mexico well yeah i mean i think you're you just hit the nail on the head like this this particular protocol isn't working because mexico has figured out that they can just do it whenever they're losing because they're the worst losers of any sports fandom ever they start fights they throw batteries they throw urine they throw punches they throw beer they throw you know everything imaginable at fans of the opposing team at players um and they continue to do childish pathetic behavior people who do not respect other humans clearly because they think that this is just funny and we're not talking just about the chant we're talking about everything else that goes on with it i mean people are leaving the stadium bloody because mexico fans can't handle the fact that their team is trash their team is finished they have zero good talent and they can't beat the u.s national team and they're starting fights in the stands on top of everything else so the answer is to me no mexico involved no fans allowed at tournaments like this i'm sorry you have proven that you can't do this in adult manners so stay your butts at home because y'all don't deserve it sorry um you know but Jorge, what is a points deduction going to do for for what? What points? What competition are they getting points deduction for? We ain't got none of those. What you going to take points away from them in Nations League? Like I, I forfeit, sure, but like again, in what capacity? Because we're done with Nations League. You know, is it next Nations League they're getting points deduction? I I, I just I, I don't that doesn't make sense in a international competition they don't have world cup qualifiers coming up though that's the problem they don't have world cup qualifiers coming up they have automatically qualified yeah to 2026 so you so, have to start hitting them where it actually matters and that's the pocketbook because uh you know they or maybe not the pocketbook but you have to ban them you know and that's just what it is is that it's hard to do in CONCACAF competitions because you don't have control over who's actually buying tickets especially when you talk about all these finals that take place in the u.s so you can't be like oh tickets not bought from you know you can't sell tickets in mexico well we know that most of these people coming to the games to support l3 are mexican americans who buy the tickets here in the states i mean obviously you're in dallas texas is a hugely especially mexican immigrant population and a lot of people there um you know hail from from mexico and it's hard. So like, it's going to be hard to do it, but I, I just think that if the, 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 the biggest thing they could do is just not allow Mexico to take play to play in these competitions. However, CONCACAF isn't going to do that. So you have to find other ways and it, it could be something like Mexico is not allowed to play games uh, in the U S until after the 2026 world cup. Maybe that's something because this seems to happen a lot in the U S um, it does, you know, maybe it's something like you aren't allowed to have fans at your home games. I don't know what the solution necessarily is, but it comes down to you can't have fans in the sands because every time they're in the sands, they act a fool. And we're not even talking just the chant. We're talking about how they make this, the place a dangerous environment for anyone to be in. How did you think that Drew Fisher handled it last night in the middle? Not well. I, I actually thought Drew Fisher had a, a little bit of a rough game. Um, and you know, luckily VAR came to his aid to, yeah. you know, Ooh. truly show that wow. that was a, oh, you know, that, was a, that, that was a, a bad penalty call. That was, a, that, was a, that was a whiff and a simulation yellow. Yes. Yeah. And in review, it was handled correctly. Um, I, I thought he struggled last night, um, which is weird for him. Cause I thought he would be, he made the most sense of the, you know, the referee to, to take on this match. Um, but I think in this particular case, I, I don't think that head the, the center referee is actually the one making these types of calls, if that makes sense. I mean, again, I think we had this conversation with the Women's Gold Cup about how, you know, the center ref was saying, hey, this field sucks. What are we doing? And the CONCACAF people were like, well, we're still playing. Yeah, you look at the match um, coordinator and the match coordinator is like, yeah, yes, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think that Drew Fisher is the only person making these decisions. He is just the person who stops the game. Um, and and that, to me, is, again, one of the problems that it doesn't seem like the referee has full autonomy to, you know, maybe they do, but I'm sure that there are briefings that say, okay, well, we say this, but this is actually the protocol. And it probably has a lot to do with, you know, CONCACAF officials 
telling him, hey, we got to stop the match. They did the thing again. Okay, so for those that don't know the 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 protocol, it's a three step. It's a three step process. First step is announcement over PA. You stop the you stop the match, and that is and you saw the announcement on the, the Jerrytron where after the second instance of it where I thought that Drew had stopped the match once before and had gone to step one when he did not, the second instance on television created step number one. You see the warning on the Jerrytron. The players are standing in the middle of the pitch. Step number two is that the center ref pulls the players. Game goes into a delay. Third step is the forfeiting of the match. What we are seeing in... The, the fans of L Tree is the weaponization of a chant, Bart, yes. to the point that you that you are saying it is not attached to its first focus that it was brought into uh brought into the the purview of the delays and the steps and and removals from matches. It is now mm-hmm. turned into a weapon by fans of L Tree when their team is losing. Mm-hmm. And that, that is where this has gone. It has gone from being number one reason for the chant, number one reason for the implementation of the three-step process, to fans being mad and now using that chant as a weapon against the match itself mm-hmm. and a weapon against their own club. Yeah. Bart, yeah, you. and again, they're, they're petulant children who can't accept the fact that they're not good anymore. And you know, the, th- that's, th- that's what it is. They're spoiled little brats who can't handle the fact that we're better than them and consistently proving it. The fact that they can't even get over, you know, the fact that we've beaten them, you know, seven times in a row, they can't freaking even score a goal on us. You know, it's been cue the meme. It's been 83 years, uh, you know, before, it's, it's since Mexico scored a goal on the U S it feels like. And, yeah. and I think the problem is the process and this protocol just doesn't work. And CONCACAF needs to find a better solution um, because clearly once you get into the game, you're not stopping the game. Please stop. We're not doing this. Well, and but- especially for a crowd thing, this works yeah. to Maddie's question earlier about like, how do you deal with this as a referee? You can't, you can't, you can deal with this. If players do something, um, you can do this. Maybe at my level, if a parent says something bad, I can be like, you're out of here. But at the, with what a hundred, I mean, how many people does Jerry Rolls hold? You know, 80 well, to 100,000 people. It, I know it wasn't it fully holds, full last night, yeah. It had 60 last night, it holds 100 in the building, yeah. and you can have 110 on the pro on the property. You got 60,000 people, there's no way that a referee can control that. Stop, that's that's absolutely not going to happen, right? We're, we're look at this level, you're just lucky you control the 22 people on the field, let alone you know the people on the benches. So, I think it's insane to even try to put this on the referee. Um, and I think the problem has to be keeping these people from the, the solution has to be keeping these people from being in the stadium. Cause once they get in there, that's where the problems come. So then let me ask you this though, when it comes to minutes added, it is referees discretion mm-hmm. about adding full minutes. True. If you sit there uh, and say, you know, Hey, there's six on the clock. Can't you call it and sit there and it's like, nope, we're done? Well, I mean, you could, yes, yes and no. I mean, in this case, you could say, no, we're done. You, We've reached step, you know, at whatever we were at, 27, because I don't think we actually, we went one, two, one, two, one, zero, one, zero, three. Like, you know, that, that we kind of jumped around the processes. Uh, he could have easily said, no, we're done. Especially after the second time when we stopped the match, he could have just been like, mm, done. Yeah. But... No, you're not going to, once you say six minutes, you're not really supposed to go down from that. Let's just put it that way. Like, well, then, but then, but then let me, but considering what we were in in that protocol, could you not have sat there and if he he could have and said, we're done because of this? Like, he could have like done this thingy and been like, you know, we're done. Yeah. But again, he's not the one fully making these decisions. Yeah. Um, Drew Fisher is not acting alone. He is enacting orders given to him by CONCACAF. He's not acting alone. Um, let's talk about L3 for a second. And, and this was the point that I made in uh, hour number one when Abe Gordon was on. Right now, L3 to me seems a lot like the women's national team for the U.S. 
where you have veteran players and for whatever reason, you, you might have young players, we don't really know because they're not getting minutes and you're stunting the growth of your program with these veterans that you have and you're not getting the results because you have these veterans, but you think you need to have the veterans to get the results that you're chasing. It seems like El Tree on the men's side is stuck in a hell of a catch 22 right now, and they don't want to take that step to play the younger players to develop their game forward. And you continue to have results deep in tournaments like you had last night. Am I off? Um, well, yes, because the U.S. women have won four World Cups okay. <laughs> and had an unprecedented stretch of success. And I think um, both teams are definitely in a down generation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's particularly analogous, but I, I see what you're saying there. Yeah. Um, I just think for Mexico, their problem is they're not developing a lot of young talent. I, I genuinely think that's the problem. I think there's also issues with Liga Emeki's pricing players a lot high we know that their market internally is way inflated kind of like MLS premier is, league with intra team yeah. deals yeah yeah which by the way mls needs to be careful with this because as we saw with miles robinson clearly he's not worth here what he's worth in europe i um, mean that's what it comes down to is those players are worth more in mexico than they are in europe right um whether that's also a european problem of not valuing north american players the same is an, another discussion to be had but right. um I think the problem for Mexico is just that they're not developing talent the way that they used to. And we're, we're seeing this by the fact that they're trying to steal all of our dual nationals. You know, I mean, like they're, they're going after uh, the Cowell brothers because they happen to have Mexican American, you know, Mexican descent back in their family tree. Um, it, it, you know, part of it also, I think is to your point, they have a group of, of established veterans, but even that they've kind of, you know, weeded out a little bit i mean outside of memo Ochoa, i don't think there's like a i don't know if there's anyone behind a starter last night that's like yeah. absolutely um better than whoever because i don't know who would be in net for well that I, I don't know i don't know either john like i think that's a legitimate question i mean memo clearly is the best option they have yeah. um but I'm with you that also maybe that's a problem because they keep playing Memo Ochoa and not really trying to find that, that replacement, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's, we, we have yet another nation's league and it's another set of wins for uh, the United States. Third one in a row. When you look at this tournament on the whole, obviously we looked at uh, Jamaica and it's now the Iceland of the Caribbean and El Tree with their issues. What other takeaways do you have from Nations League on the whole? It can be more U.S. stuff, but uh, uh, any other disappointments, any other surprises from Nations League in the tournament? What else sticks out in your mind? Yeah, my takeaway, and I'll, I want to throw this back at you, John, but I think my takeaway is CONCACAF needs to stop having tournaments every day on the year. <laughs> um, but you know why. I, I mean, I fully know why. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's it's to improve the competition in the region, John. That's why. I mean, without Nations League, we don't get the Virgin Derby. You know, I mean, we, we got to admit that. We don't get the Virgin Derby without the Nations League. Oh, but, uh, oh I could have pursued that and, and mentioned something, but I'm just going to let that go. You, you know me. There was some, you, you teed that up there, and knowing me, if, if that's on the tee, then I'm going to swing too quickly, and it's going to be a massive slice, and it's going to go off into the netting. And, I, you know, that, that was one that I'm just going to let slide on a Monday. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I think, I think that's my biggest takeaway is with gold cup every two years Yeah, and nations league every, it seems like year now I, I I'm okay with nations league being more frequent. Yeah. If you make gold cup only once every four years. Um, and I do think that actually to me, nations league is better for the lower tier teams uh -huh. because you're getting more consistent competition. As opposed to with Gold Cup, you just hope you qualify for a tournament. And then when you don't qualify, what do you do? Because mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, there were Nations League games going on this past weekend. Yeah. Um, there Levels, were, levels I, I think these were, TV and Yeah, I mean, we're talking League C, but, you know, they were finishing that out. Yeah. Uh, I think League B as well. So, I mean, again, that's why we got the Virgin Derby between, you know, the U.S. and British Virgin <laughs> Islands, which <laughs> is fantastic. Um, oh. Virgin Derby. And, and, you know, I think that's something that I, if I'm going to evaluate this, and this is something I felt about CONCACAF for a while, is I thought the Gold Cup every two years is silly to begin with. But 
having now this tournament, I, I don't think it, look, you saw the attendance in the stadium. I think that tells you everything you need to know. The 60,000 last night, yeah. it was about 45 ish for the semifinals. Um, and, you know, to me, that just is a barometer of how fans go, oh, and okay, another Nations League. And on top of that, you're doing this, what, three months before Copa America? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you where I'm spending my money. Uh, I believe that would be at the Copa America. Yeah, the two games here in Atlanta. I'm not going uh, to Dallas for that. You know, <laughs> and... you, want Ar- so, you, want, I, you want Argentina and Canada. That's where you're spending your money. Oh, that's right. Can- congrats, Canada, for having to qualify and then getting into – Argentina's group couldn't happen to a worse group of people. <laughs> uh, quoting Jorge again this morning to quote Disney villain syndrome when everyone's special, no one is right. And that's, uh, I think you're right. And that's kind of the problem is that I, I, I think if I could, I like the idea of nations league because I do think it gives the teams a more, uh, it, it creates competition for those lower leagues it does not create competition, and I'm sorry, it does not create real competition for teams six and up, mm-hmm. you know, eight and up maybe. Yeah. I think League A is fine, but like even in League A in the past, we still got a team like St. Kitts and Nevis. You know, we still got teams like that. And once you get past the top eight or ten teams in this region, it's not really – a good use of, and I'm speaking of this purely for obviously from a U.S. perspective, but even for like a Mexico or a Canada, Canada's not going to get anything out of playing Antigua and Barbuda, you know? And, and I think that's the thing is that for those teams, we just want to fast forward to the actual competition, but for teams like St. Kitts, for teams like Nicaragua, for teams like, um, you know, Cuba, Puerto Rico, those types of teams, this is a valuable tournament because they get actual competitive matches as opposed to Gold Cup stuff where they don't really get that because if they don't qualify, which Nations League is part of the qualification for that, they don't qualify for them, it's just not playing. And so you're, you're, I think that's the thing is that Nations League is a benefit to the Confederation as a whole, but it's not a benefit to USA, Mexico, even, you know, even to an extent Jamaica. Um, who, you know, while they played really well against us um, and did win third place, like those, they're, they're a level above the rest of the Caribbean teams, you know. Um, but it's still a good tournament to have. I just wish that it, we didn't have to also have the Gold Cup every two years. I wish we didn't have to have this, you know, every year. Um, and CONCACAF needs to figure that out. Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent from the U.S. men's national team from a roster perspective. Who was good? Who was bad? I guess quoting our old buddy Chuck Dowdle, the old GBU. What was the uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly for you? There were only two bads. Um, the first was Joe Scally. Was you know he had a bad game. Um, the you know looking back more, the, that goal that Jamaica scored wasn't all his fault by any stretch, and I think Tim Weah deserves a lot of blame. I think Jedi should have defended better. But he also looked bad the rest of the, the match, right? I mean, he got pulled at halftime for a reason. Yeah. Um, you're on and, and, you not risk it in the semi, too. Right, right. <laughs> um, the other player who had, I think, a bad sh- outing was Eunice Musa against Jamaica. I also think that's because Eunice was put in a position that he's not actually that good at. When it, He can play a defensive-minded six. He's great at beating people on the dribble. But if you ask him to be a facilitator of offense via passing that's not where Eunice is going to thrive and the fact that Tyler Adams was better at that than he was is a little bit problematic um so I think those are the only two players who really had any sort of negatives against them um the, from the positives though I mean Serginho Dust was amazing last night um I thought Haji Wright obviously showed so well this tournament mm-hmm. um and and makes that striker competition even more interesting because you know I, I still think Ballo is you know, Falar and Balogun is still the most talented striker we have. But at the end of the day, you got to score. Yeah, you got to be productive. And Haji was very productive for this team in these two games. Um, so, you know, I think Haji was the one who had the biggest high. Gio was a very good high, but like, you know, we know what Gio is. He, yeah. he, he met expectations. Yes. Um, and maybe the other positive is just seeing Tyler Adams play soccer again. You know, um, that was good. But I, I don't think there were any real, real bads. Because even with Eunice and Joe, it's like, well, you had a bad game out of 
what we've seen of you be pretty good. So it's, you know, okay, you had a bad game, but I thought for the most part, um, even in that Jamaica game, even though it was slow, like players were playing okay. Um, and they made up for it against Mexico. The, the test though, John is going to be the summer. And that's kind of where we're at with this team is you can dominate CONCACAF all you want. You got to go prove it against, you know, better competition from the rest of the world. Yes. And uh, at the same time, for Copa America, you're going to have this this roster that was European League dominant. I think this will be bet pretty much the roster for Copa America, to be honest. Which presents to me an interesting situation slash juggling act for the coaching staff because they will be coming off of their seasons, which will have been completed. And so right now, this time of year, they're used to being in league play. So they're they're used to the demands of your time and, and everything. But in Copa, your season will be over. You will be continuing to play in the summer after your league play is done. So I'm wondering, this is going, for me, this is going to be something that I'm going to be keeping an eye on is the, the overall uh, well-being of your players, knowing that their seasons are over and they're still having to play in international play. That's something for me I'm going to keep. Yeah, I mean, look, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, they have their best players playing in Europe as well. You know, mm-hmm. Mexico doesn't have good players. I that's false. They have their best players playing in Europe. They're just not very good. But uh-huh. you know, we're we're all going to have to deal with it. Yeah. Um. I think again, that's why you saw you know the U.S. schedule two friendlies in early June. Um. To get the players in there, hopefully keep them here a little bit for training camp. Um. You know, ahead of that June twenty third start because you know your your Brazil gap matches on June twelfth. So you yeah. have what eleven days between the two. Hopefully mm-hmm. they get a little bit of a break and then. Um, you know, you come back ready to play, or maybe it's just a really long training camp. I don't know. Um, but I think it's a fair question. I just think that it you're not going to not call in your best players because I'm sorry, there's yeah. no one, you're right. no one playing in MLS who matches the level of anyone over in Europe right now. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, it's, it'll be something monitored. You mentioned St. Kitts and Nevis, and that triggered this. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis had two friendlies. And uh, over the last couple of days with our friends from San Marino, the San Marino, oh, National, nice. San Marino national team right there. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis won the first one, three nil San Marino did not lose the second one yesterday. It was a goalless draw. So San Marino didn't lose, but they didn't score. So I figured that would be the, uh, that's about as best as I could probably ask for. Correct. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to figure out the last time that our, our friends from San Marino actually won a match. Did not happen with these two friendlies with St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, what's the latest with soccer for US POD and what's coming on? We will uh, be recording probably tomorrow night with looking at availability. And we'll have that episode out this week talking about this, uh, you know, the third Nations League in a row that we've won. Mm-hmm. Three in a row, John. Three yes. feet. Three. Three in a row. Uh, as always, my friend, great to have you in on Mondays. And obviously, you know that when you want to vent your spleen about things, you know that you can always crash at any time. Basically, the way that this works with Bart, outside of his normally scheduled times, he will either text me or email me and go link me. And that, you know, and that way he'll want to crash and, and talk about stuff. So uh, uh, enjoy the, the rest of what's in your mug that will not have any butter in it, sir. Uh, no, not, no butter. Not to have Nations League once again to the U.S. men's national team. Thanks for hanging out with us on a Monday, and uh, go grab some late breakfast or some lunch. We'll catch up with you soon. Hey, Atlanta, though, we're up next. She yes. believes Cup in two weeks. So that is hope true. To see you all there. Get your tickets now and make sure that there's more than 49,000 in MBS. Bart's going to keep drinking his coffee, and he'll roll from there. Uh, yes, Alex, thank you. Speaking of San Marino, uh, oh, what are, you, what are you taunting me with here? Uh, open link in a new tab. Our friends from San Marino did what? Uh, is it? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, desire to face Mexico and be able to win a game after 20 years. Yes. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. San Marino wasting no time. They're, they're, they're chasing after folks. Well done, San Marino. Uh, time for me to go to the top of the order and welcome folks in here for the final half hour of the show. Once again, anything else that's on your mind, uh, that's what today's all about. It's reaction Monday could be reactions about, uh, your favorite team. Teams that drive you crazy, any news uh, that's going on, or it could be about San Marino wanting to challenge El Tree to a match and trying to, to win something 
uh, for the first time in 20 years. Morning, Alex. Morning, Will. Morning, Tom. Morning, Michael. Michael has a theory. Less ambitious owners in Major League Soccer like playing through international breaks. It keeps more parity. Uh, we'll get into what happened uh, tomorrow uh, through the rest of Major League Soccer. Some crazy results. And we'll get into uh, what is going on there. We also have a developing story out of uh, MLS adjacent. We'll get into it coming up in just a bit. Uh, Tom. Weekend recap, death taxes, Atlanta United, they weren't embarrassed in the international break. That's a bit much, I think. USMNT plays to the competition. Mexico fans are trash. Morning, Kefsi. Morning, Will. Will, one out of seven USA-Mexico matches ends in a 2-0 win for the U.S. per Opta Jack. One out of every seven. And uh, and Michael, being the Auburn grad, is uh, discussing things with Auburn. Uh, Auburn did have a seven-point lead against Yale. The boss is not happy, and Auburn did not make it out of weekend number one. Michael Valverde, 3GB for president. Uh, David, since the 3-2 Nations League final in 2021, David believes Mexico has scored one goal versus the United States in the Gold Cup. Miles Robinson, he seems to recall. Mexico being dangerous, but shots horribly erratic. I think in three-plus years, Mexico strikers have been letting that squad down. Cost Tata his job will cost more men their jobs until they find someone to score in big games. Yeah, and uh, Gignac is not in his 20s. So uh, that's that's a problem. The, the, the depth and the youth are issues right now. And Mexico reminds me, sadly, a lot of current-day Brazil. Brazil, we know what to we, – we have in our brain the idea of what Brazil means to soccer. Yoga Bonito, all that. It ain't that now. It's a painful watch. It's a slog watching Brazil. And it's painful for different reasons for Mexico. Once again, I think they are too old. They don't have any depth. They don't have any youth. And when they start to trail, they just get frustrated. They lash out, commit nasty fouls. They want to try and fall down and go the official into making calls, these kinds of things. So Mexico and Brazil, two traditional powers in world soccer, aren't that right now. And, and it's, a, it's a painful watch for Brazil in international tournaments. And Mexico just gets you mad because they, they, they're, they're trying to use cunning and guile to try to, to draw fouls. And the yellow for simulation inside the 18 was an example of that. The, to give you an idea, I watched the match on Tuda NA because I like to get – the the Hispanic perspective on things and how it's called and what they do and try to learn as a broadcaster at the same time. When that particular moment happened, they went to replay. They were laughing on air about how poor a simulated uh, foul that was. And they were, they were like, ah, no penal. And they, they're laughing on the air about that particular incident. And that's what that's what Mexico is down to right now. On the field, off the field. And I think that the point that Bart made and Maddie made is that right now with Mexico, with El Tree, with their fan base, I think you're going to have to get to the point. But I know that Victor Montaliani may not do this because of the revenue that's attached. Fans of El Tree cannot be in the building. They can't. Because you're going to continue to have incidents like this where you weaponize a chant and take it away from its original and and take the protocol away from its original intent because fans lash out now because they're mad. They're not lashing out because they're just stupid. They're lashing out now because they're both stupid and mad. I am not saying that all fans of El Tree are this way. But when you have a building like Jerry World, where you have fans during Matt Turner goal kicks, using the chant as a weapon against your club because you are trailing 2-0 with 20 minutes to go, and you're mad, fine. If you're mad, you know what? Match is over. Everybody go home. I legitimately was to the point to where you're you're north of 90 plus and everything is still going on. And Drew Fisher, whom I thought had gone to stage one, one kick previous to when he did. 
Uh, literally, it's like, look, you're north of 90. With what's on the board, with what's happening, this is not going to get any better. We're done. Go home. Everybody goes inside. Everybody goes home. Match is over. And I know that the, the uh, Mexican Federation would be mad about something like that. Oh, there were still six minutes. We could have scored twice. Really? You've got to call it at that point. I, I, I legitimately was to the point when we were north of 90 minutes, and you're hearing, the, you're hearing the chant, you're hearing the kicks. It's not stopping. Call it. You're done. We're, we're out of here. Prove a point. Show to your fans, all right, you know, hey, look, you did this. You've got to, if you're CONCACAF, you've got to have the you did this moment. You've got to have these you did this moments. You've got to have those. You've got to have those moments. You've got to show your fans you caused this. And at the same time, I think that you've got to have empty buildings, but we know the main reason why that's never going to happen, because of the revenue that's attached. So that's where we are. Um, David, apparently there's a Snyder Cut of the Breakfast Club. Okay. All right. I did not know about the Snyder Cut. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Morning, Abby. Morning, Tom. Yeah, and Abby right there. Uh, thinking Mexico fans shouldn't be allowed at the national team's next game. And would have liked to have seen Luke Brennan take the field in Toronto. Uh, yeah, Kefsi, I expected goals from Jamal, Nick, Shaba, and Shande. But not all in one match. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, Kefsi was very happy to see Tyler uh, Tyler Adams uh, massively uh, blossom a shot. Uh, if, I, if I read that verbatim... Um, Eh, people might obviously get a uh, get a get a chuckle. Uh, Michael once again says, "Glad the men's national team won, but until they do something in a tournament outside of Concacaf." Dot dot dot. Um, <laughs> Tom, my reaction to Adam's goal was probably the same as most. No, not from there. Oh my God, yes, absolutely. Uh, Abby, how do we draw games for two major holidays, Easter and Rosh Hashanah? Because people want to see Atlanta United. Uh, only 1% chance of rain Sunday expected. It'll be great to see everybody outside. Uh, I imagine right now that it, with a high of 78, it's uh, going to be in lot 17, hopefully. Yes, it will be pollen season. See, now, the first Southern team that comes up with a pollen jersey as an alternate, I will give you full credit. I will give you absolute full credit, as Hutch says, it's pollen season. Give me Somebody needs to give me a pollen jersey. Uh, Tom, a legal question. Uh, we know, and this is one thing that has gotten to me too, that the our friends at uh, the National Broadcasting Corporation and the Multicolored Bird Network, they are going to have the Fan Fest for the League in England in Nashville in a few weeks. Not the developing home of U.S. soccer, mind you. But Nashville, when that was announced, I, I literally gave them the, the the rock's eyebrow. Okay. I know what you're going to do. You're going to put it on the Broadway, and you're going to have you're going to have folks in cowboy hats and boots and the whole schmear. What you need to do, well, but you can't have it on the bridge because you need to have too many people in the walking traffic. Uh, I don't know if it would can handle the weight, but. You're going to have it on Broadway. I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. Because you really can't have it to Geotis because there's no place to park and there's no place really to have Fan Fest without shutting down that entire area. And if you did it on the grounds of the IndyCar race, it'd be over at Nissan Stadium and then you're still looking at space and things like that. So my guess is you're going to have it on Broadway and you're going to sit there and and play to, to everyone there. Instead of having it at Centennial Olympic Park at the developing home of the Nash, of the U.S. National, uh, national Team and the National Training Center. But okay, fine. Tom is planning on going, I guess, because he says when he runs onto the uh, Fan Fest set in Nashville in a few weeks with a, quote, Premier League is the most corrupt league in the world sign, what will they do? A trespassing charge. First off, Tom, I don't know if they would let you inside the gates 
with that sign. The only way, and we neither condone nor endorse this behavior, is sit there and go, well, you know, maybe you should just wander in with a blank piece of cardboard and a marker and then put whatever you want to say on on a particular piece of paper. But I don't know how they respond to, like I said, I don't know how outside security or the security at the gates to let you in to FanFest is going to respond. I don't know if they let you bring in your own poster board or it has to be a league-sanctioned poster board. And you have to have your own marker and you make your own little sign. So I don't know. Uh, Tom, I don't know if they will let you in with your own cardboard. You might have to do it on one of their prefab signs and, and write the information down. I would imagine that they will probably try and find a way to confiscate the sign. I don't think they will get you a trespassing charge, but I think they will try and find a way to take the piece of cardboard and the dry erase away from you. I don't know if it would make air. You would have to be very strategic in knowing how the set is laid out and have a piece of paper large enough to be picked up, which means you'd have to be very, very close to the set. So I don't know if your sign would actually make it just because of a proximity issue and needing to write large enough. You probably would need four of those prefab pieces, taped them together, and trying to figure out, okay, here's what, uh, here's what we need to do. Just a guess. Like I said, I don't think that your standard piece of poster board would make it inside the perimeter. Uh, reminder, uh, apparently I played ropes in fantasy this past week. If you haven't joined the fantasy league, join the fantasy league. I always forget to do this. And the, the fantasy suggestions from the Jason Wright agency never make it in time on Friday for me to announce them for the weekend. Uh, join the fantasy league, Jason Wright agency on Facebook, right with a W Jason, Wright with a W A G E N on the 20, uh, 280 character app, join the fantasy league. If you haven't. And you can and beat, you know, you can beat me consistently. The only reason that I beat ropes was because I had Denny Buanga. I captained Denny Buanga. And the question after that, and we could probably talk about this more tomorrow. How closely are folks looking at Gary Smith now in Nashville after giving up five to LAFC? Keep an eye on that. Uh, so we'll keep uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Dell. Uh, at least the battery won 4-0 over to Mexico United. Burhalter kept his job until after Copa. Uh, Hutch, Guzan should sue for non-support. I mean, and this is the other element in, in this, and we can talk about this more tomorrow as well. Uh, very, very busy, very, very busy week here at SDH. We've got high school every day except today. We'll go over the schedule at the end of the show. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it is all high school games in the afternoon and evening on the live at soccerdownhere.mixler.com. Um, I wouldn't say non-support, but once again, we, we'd mentioned with Abe in the first half hour about relationships and getting acquainted with folks and, and understanding, well, if I go here, then I know instinctively someone's going to go there. When you don't have seven players and half of your starting 11, obviously Noah Cobb, to me, grew into the game with Atlanta United and being paired with Derek Williams. Uh, that was a, a good uh, dichotomy there where you have the experience of Derek. You've got the experience of Brad from behind. You've got the experience of Dax McCarty in front of you to, to help you out in navigating the situation. So I think it was, excuse me, I think it was a good learning experience for Noah as he continues to grow into and grow into a pro. Uh, yeah, and Tom, we mentioned, why do we always seem to have twice as many? Because you pick good players and they're wanted by their countries. But like, you know, like we were saying, just think if Saba wasn't uh, a part of the Georgian qualifiers where, where things might be. Uh, Michael, playing through international breaks, promotes parity. Uh, don't, ropes don't know uh, about GG and starting this weekend. And that's probably going to be one of the things that uh, if you're at Mercedes Benz on Easter Sunday, one of the things that Joe and I will talk about on prescription for victory. So uh, it'll be who's back and who's left and who's right for Chicago, and, and all those other kinds of things. So uh, we'll look at all of that in prescription for victory. We'll monitor what's going on overseas with the, the European window and how many minutes folks had in the European window flying back, how they're going to condition late in the week. We'll keep an eye on all that stuff with uh, the six-pack that were lost and keep an eye on the injury for Steon Gregerson. Um, you know, if Michael says, if I were Arthur, I'd be yelling, what's the point of having superior talent when you can't play him? 
uh, having the superior talent when you can. And it's, you know, it is, it is an honor to be selected by your country. And, you know, so would you rather have players that aren't stars for their country that don't get called up and you're not going to be getting the, the results and the talent that you have on the field for your domestic team? So, I mean, think about it from your Chelsea perspective, Michael, Well, in the old days. But, of course, you get into the cap discussion and all those other kinds of things, and that's other stuff that needs to be addressed going forward, is you've got to loosen the elements on the cap so you can have deeper rosters and continue to build and do what Atlanta United is doing with their build, but at the same time have other players that are out there as well and the the deeper rosters uh, as a part of Major League Soccer. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and, and yeah, maybe different roster building strategy until uh, MLS Wise is up anyway. So we'll see. Um, and Rope says, I wonder how it would have looked if Jay Fortune hadn't been called up for Trinidad and Tobago. I think that you probably would have had Dax starting still because that's why you brought Dax in in the first place. And you have that experience. And then you have Jay come in for the final 30 fresh legs and all that, like you would have seen with Mosqueda. Uh, on the right-hand side, and possibly a Luke Brennan as well. So um, it's managing the 60s and the 30s and trying to figure out what you want to do with your club. But, yeah, I still think it would have been Dak starting. I think Jay would have come in as a sub. You want on the road in a situation like this with so many pieces missing, you want that experience at the back. And I think that that's – and that's why Dax was brought in, to be that voice at practice, to be that spot starter, to be your six, to help you out at the back. Um so uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. And Abby, Abby was there. And, and Abby, thank you for, for coming into the booth and giving Maddie the, the gifts you did. That was very, very cool. Abby gave, Abby came in and I think it was at halftime. Abby came in to the booth at the fraction and she gave Maddie a reversible twos bucket hat, which she loved. And one of our Action at the Fraction t-shirts, which you can still buy. Our store is still up. Go to SoccerDownHere.net. Click on the store. You can get our Action at the Fraction t-shirts. Get all of our gear that's there and uh, rep SDH. And we love it when you do. You can, see, you can, get, you can get this. You can get, you can get the, the zipper sweat jacket, which I have and I love. And this is a double X, and it, it is a double X. It literally is incredibly large. So uh, maybe a, a little larger than size when it comes to jackets and things. But you can still... Go to our store and get all of our gear. Uh, not as annoying to see Toronto youth find goals instead of of uh, uh, the the uh, yeah, seeing Insigne and Bernadeschi chasing after goals. Uh, also, uh, let's see, <laughs> Will, when we're going through the goals at the end of hour number one. No, it was incorrect. Everything about MLS Next Pro referees this week. I'm guessing something happened in Huntsville. So, uh, Will, let me know what happened in Huntsville. And, and yeah, Hutch, I think we are going to start calling Javi Armas Agent 86. I think we are. I think that's stuck. And I also think that Jarrett wanted to try to start the Possums as a nickname for Atlanta United, too. So uh, we'll get into that uh, and get into that discussion as well. Uh, David says, when something's 86, isn't it a phrase to mean a restaurant's out of something? Or just, it, it, you're 86, you're done. Uh, maybe opponents are 86 out of ideas on how to stop him. That could be true, yeah. Uh, so I think that David, yeah, I think we go with agent 86 and when you 86 something, yeah, you're done with it. So, uh, you can't find anything going on with Javier Armas. Um, and Abby was at Fado last night and, uh, yeah, Jarrett did the Irish goodbye because the real world steps in. Why? And Dell, why was our start so different in this game versus the Jamaica game? The rivalry, I think that's still a part of it, but once again, Jamaica to me, when Heimar Hogramson came in to be coach. They make a point to play the Icelandic style that bored us all to tears in the Euros. Literally, they don't want the ball. They're going to stand and defend. And it is so counter to what we're used to seeing with Jamaica. It might be a bit of a sticker shock. But it is counter to what we're used to seeing with Jamaica. They stand, defend, kick the ball long, try to you know have somebody run under it. And, and, and also when you're shorthanded, like they were going into the semifinal, they got players back for the uh, for the uh, third place match. But also, when you have folks that are not out, you're going to play. Literally, I saw I saw a line of five and a line of four times in the in the semi, 
and it was a little better in the third place match where you did have a line of five, but it was Iceland soccer is now Jamaican soccer, and it bores you to tears. And I think that what they try to do is bore you to death and have Andre Blake in net. Everybody was sitting there saying it's going to be 3-0, three, 4-0. Three nil, nil. Look, Andre Blake was in net, and this is the semifinal. Andre Blake was in net. You're not putting three past Andre Blake. With a defense that's packing it in inside the 18, it's just not going to happen. So the fact that it was three, but it took an extra 30, not a surprise. The fact that it was only that it was one and it was off an own goal at 90 plus five, not a surprise. So the 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 pundits at the desk that were sitting there saying, yeah, three and four and no, you're missing, folks. You're packing it in. You pack it in anyway. So you double packed it in. You've got Andre Blake in net. You're not going to get three past. You're not going to get three past Andre Blake in a normal 90 minutes. And you did. not So it happened. And and Dell, to your point about Burhalter, like I said, I have maintained that I'm not a two cycle guy. But that's where we are right now. And you beat Mexico and you've done it for the seventh time in a row, which is never a bad thing. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see what uh, Abby's saying, uh, missing out on not being at Fado in person for a U.S. match. Do you think, Dell, do you think the game will motivate club coaches to start Reem, Turner, and Reyna? Uh, no, no, and no. Fulham, maybe, of the three. Matt Turner is in a situation at Nottingham Forest, as is Gio Reyna. So we can we can knock out Nottingham Forest here as one group. That you bought Mott Sells, you brought him in to take over for Turner. The thing about Evangelinus Maranakis and Nottingham Forest is that he his the reason that they're part of the reason that they're in violation of profit and sustainability rules, he brought in 42 players to the sum total of a quarter of a billion dollars. Matt Turner, you brought in because he was the hot property. Ooh, shiny object. And so you go and chase after Matt Turner, not denying his ability, but Evangelinus Marnakis is drawn to shiny objects. You bring in Matt Turner. Your defense doesn't help Matt Turner out, so it's obviously Matt Turner's fault under Steve Cooper. And so then you bring in Mott Sells to take over the number one slot over Matt Turner. Gio Reyna was brought into Nottingham Forest specifically because of his agent and the agent's relationship. Now, remember, Gio Reyna changed agents. Gio Reyna changed agents to an agent that is a buddy of of Evangelinus Maranakis, is the owner of Nottingham Forest. And he has helped Maranakis stack his other clubs. So this was a roster stacking move. Hey, my guy, Gio Reyna, whoop, whoop. Gio Reyna has played 30 eight minutes in the time that he has been at Nottingham Forest. That should, and this is the point that we made in the semifinal, this should tell you something. The fact that he's getting more national team minutes versus team minutes at Nottingham Forest, that should tell you something. But the move of Gio Reyna to Nottingham Forest was specifically tied to the agent that Gio Reyna shifted to and the relationship that that agent has with Evangelinus Maranakis, the owner of Nottingham Forest, as a roster stack. So that's that's where we are. Will wants to give penalties uh, when it comes to the chance. I think you need to have empty stadia. I, I really do. I think you need to have empty stadia. No, no fans of El Tree in a situation like that. No fans domestically or internationally. You can't get a ticket in the designated supporters section that's tied to, and you know that folks are going to buy tickets anyway. Then they're going to put the, you know, they're going to have the heavy coat on, then they're going to take the heavy coat off. Oh, look, an El Tree jersey. Those situations will happen, but those sections that are locked into being supporter sections for El Tree, no fans. No direct links to selling tickets to the fans of El Tree. Yeah, Hutch, laser, red, you know, the red lasers aimed at eyes during PKs. Yeah, and Michael, yeah, too much money to give up. Yeah, the biggest thing, Tom, would be trying to figure out what tournament do you ban them from. They're not going to be banned from 26. And you know, so anything between now and 26 is going to be counterintuitive to the building of a program. Uh, morning from the, the, the West Coast, Best Coast. Good to have you guys here in the morning. I'm still shocked that you guys start your breakfast with us. That is very humbling. Um, 
Abby says she saw some fighting in the second level of video on, the, on one of the social apps on uh, in Jerry World. You know, I mean, Michael Valverde wants to use crowd VAR. That's what security cameras are for, allegedly. And Wiley, it might have been some ring rust on the lockout, which reminds me uh, to bring that point together. And I know we're going over, and uh, I apologize. From Jeff Carlisle, as of, oh, what, an hour ago. Jeff has been told there is voting on a new tentative agreement between Pro and the PSRA taking place as we speak. Voting ends at midnight tonight, Eastern Time, and they will see if the tentative agreement passes again. And uh, Jeff follows this up, quoting Jeff, I'm told that the tentative agreement is being voted on by the PSRA is for seven years. That would carry through both the current World Cup cycle and the next. And not every PSRA member is pleased with this, I'm told, but we'll see how the vote goes. So it looks like it is a seven-year agreement that is being voted on today by the PSRA and PRO. So we'll keep an eye on that, see if we have anything else to report about it tomorrow uh, as we go. Hutch, hoping that the stadia and sports leagues are accumulating data necessary to identify the bad fans from their actions, incorporate into some sort of AI-driven scanning that will allow venues to stop those fans from being admitted. Yeah, I mean, once again, how do you enforce it? Because you know that some folks are going to do the Bobby Valentine thing, wear the fake mustache, work their way in, go and, and figure it out. Uh, Abby didn't see a whole lot of security in the stands last night on TV and, and video. Uh, prize money, David, I'm sure there is David saying, take away the prize money. And, uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea because they've been fined in the past, meaning the, the FMF, the Federation has been fined in the past. I think they were fined the sum total of like 10 grand the last time it happened. Ooh, that's really going to make something there. Will wants pre-registration as fans have to have gone to at least three matches for the country to get into the country allotment and allow no Mexico fans in and Hutch, maybe subtract minutes. Who knows? Uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, Mexico has more nationalized players. Jorge says uh, the coming through than young players coming through. That's why you chased after the Cowell brothers. Um, yeah, Michael, CONCACAF really wanted to get rid of the chant. They just banned uh, Mexico from tournaments. At this point, CONCACAF showing it values money more. Well, I mean, yeah, you've got these contracts. You have these tournaments. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at their bottom line. And yeah, that's what you're. That's what you stare at. Um once again, thanks for the uh, the San Marino. Uh, can we talk about the midair nutmeg? Is there a name for that? Still having trouble processing what happened. I think that's what it was. Midair nutmeg. That's what we call it that. Uh, Alex, I wonder if she believes it was already planned when NBC wanted to have Fan Fest so they couldn't come to Atlanta anyway. I don't know, Alex. But what I would I would posit that if Fan Fest, I mean. I mean, I could, yeah, I mean, I could see if she believes was planned and, but I mean, yeah, because if she believes is with another network and then you're trying to figure that out, that might be true. There might've been conversations, but still, uh, if, if it wasn't and Nashville being voted over Atlanta, I mean, Atlanta's got to have one of these coming up soon. So stuff the ballot box when that happens. I know, Tom, you will find a way to get your sign in. There you go. Custom T-shirt. Hutch says, like I said, neither that we condone or endorse the behavior, but a custom T-shirt made wear it under the jacket. Um, yeah, so keep an eye on Lester now. Lester is apparently going to take uh, the EFL and the Premier League through legal proceedings if they go through the PSR because apparently Lester has now been written up. Lester was written up last week on PSR, and so Lester's pretty mad. And so we'll see what happens with Lester, who wants to go through legal channels and take on both the Premier League and the EFL for their alleged violations. Uh, placing the crazy match in Charlotte on the refing down here. Radar, what a debacle and neutral as a neutral third party. Uh, WTAF, and that is not a radio station in North Carolina. Uh, yeah, and true. Michaels is. Yeah, Chelsea does take international windows off. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael, I know I'm yelling at the choir. Going to keep yelling about MLS scheduling. Just bugs the ish out of him. Want the league to be considered a top league. Playing through international breaks ain't helping. Um, let's see. Uh, Hutch, give the tickets to those sections to local kids soccer teams. I'd love that. That'd be fantastic. Um, 
Yeah, and Dell, if you find the Fed, how does that make fans stop chanting? Well, then the Fed can't. Uh, it it doesn't. But I mean, it, I, I think that if you if you try to go A B C D on this, you fa- you find the Federation. The Federation uh, sits there and wags their finger at the fans. Don't do this, or we're going to have situations where we get fined and you can't show up. So cause and effect. We'll see what happens. Uh, orange and black, hundred percent. Concord calf likes money too much to do anything meaningful to the FMF. Fans travel deep and spend. Behavior won't go away until CONCACAF loses money because of it. Yes. Uh, don't look at what CONCACAF says. Watch it, what they do. That will reflect their true values. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was what else we needed to talk about today. Uh, let me go through gossip, rumor, and innuendo. I think we pretty much got a lot of it covered. If I missed anything, obviously, that's what tomorrow's for. Tomorrow, I'll be in a hotel room in Little Rock doing the show. Trying to line up some guests uh, tomorrow to discuss news that we've been talking about in deep dives on Tuesdays before. Keep you posted on that, and and we'll see uh, what we do. But once again, I'll be in a hotel room tomorrow, only for Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, by the way, it is River Ridge and Sequoia, 6 and 8, on the network at soccerdownhere.mixler.com. Maddie and Jason will be up there for that. River Ridge ranked top 10 nationally in some polls. Region title on the line. Wednesday. I will be at Denmark, Forsyth Central in Denmark for the doubleheader. I think it's 5.30 and 7.30 there. Uh, Once again, big matchups there in region play. We were at Lambert and Milton for those region matchups that set stuff up toward the top of the table. This is a chase for the three and the four with uh, Forsyth Central and Denmark on the network on Wednesday, Thursday. McIntosh and Stars Mill. Don't know how much else needs to be said about those two. McIntosh ranked nationally, chasing after a boys title in 5A. We'll see what happens there. And Friday, this is interesting. We go to the mountains. White County and Gilmer County. First time that we've been to LJ for White County and Gilmer County. Once again, region rivals chasing after positioning. We'll see what happens in the mountains. So Tuesday, River Ridge and Sequoia, 6 and 8 on the network. Remember, Jason has Atlanta soccer tonight after the matches are over at 92-9 the game. Also, Forsyth Central, Denmark, Wednesday, Stars Mill, McIntosh, Thursday, and it is uh, Gilmer County hosting White County on Friday, Atlanta United, Chicago Fire Sunday, 345 kick on Easter Sunday. Looking forward to seeing everybody there. Gossip, rumor, and innuendo. Manchester City, you're monitoring Jared Branthwaite. United, Spurs, Real Madrid also interested. Four-letter paper, take the information at your own peril. Manchester United been linked with selling Scott McTominay, but the plan, a club plan to keep him and give him an improved contract. The other four-letter paper, take the information at your own peril. Manchester United targeting Benfica midfielder Joel Nevis, 19, is one of their summer priorities, but they could also consider a move for Andre, Adrian Rabio, who plays at Juve, as a more affordable option. United also tracking Barcelona defender Mikhail Fai, who uh, at 19 faces competition from Bayer Leverkusen and Inter Milan to get signed four-letter paper. West Ham planning a move for Ivan Toney, who's been linked with Arsenal and Chelsea. Liverpool, City, Chelsea, all been linked with given a boost in their pursuit of Bruno Guimaraes with the Brazilian playmaker admitting he has other goals. Bayern Munich won a decision from Alfonso Davies next week about whether he, who has been linked with Real Madrid, will agree to a new contract with the Bundesliga champs. Spurs preparing an early summer bid between 30 and 40 million pounds for Conor Gallagher. Contract runs out in 2025. Genoa forward Albert Goodmanson is on the radar of Spurs. Inter Milan also interested in the Icelandic international. But Goodmanson would prefer to stay in Italy. Keenan joining Inter, although Juve are also following him closely. Nagelsmann says it is, quote, not impossible, end quote, that he extends his contract as Germany manager beyond the end of the summer Euros with talks of a new deal having been taken place. Benfica's Rui Pedro Braz is on a list of potential successors to take over from Dan Ashworth as sporting director at Newcastle United. What to watch? Where to watch it? Courtesy, once again, of our friends at Soccer America. And once again, keep an eye on the vote from Pro and the PSRA. Tentative agreement, seven years on the table. Voting ends at midnight tonight. Obviously, we'll have something to talk about tomorrow, either on the yay or the nay side, and we'll see what it looks like. Soccer today, friendlies on FS2. Azerbaijan, Bulgaria at noon, Sweden, Albania at 2. Golasso Network has a men's friendly with the U23s of France and the U.S. at 4 o'clock, and that is also on U.S. Soccer YouTube as well at 4 o'clock. So understandably, a light day uh, across the board. And kind of stuff to talk about, stuff to watch, 
and we'll be back at it again tomorrow. Because like I said, very, very busy day, very, very busy week for uh, all of us here at SDH. And like I said, high school soccer, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it is going to be uh, all over the places. Uh, region play is ending next week in most of the state of Georgia. It is spring break. We will have on uh, April 1st, this is no April Fool's joke, Baylor School out of uh, Chattanooga taking on Johnson Gainesville will be up there for that. And then Calhoun and Sonoraville, we will have that one on the Tuesday night. Throwdown, first visit to Sonoraville next week, and then a girls matchup, Wesleyan and Calhoun, big region matchup there. In the afternoon on Friday the 5th, 4 o'clock, and it's just that one matchup, to uh, get Wesley in there during spring break week to have the match played on the girls' side and then have them travel safely home. So uh, three appearances next week, four appearances this week for the network, soccerdownhere.mixler.com. Don't forget to download the Mixler app, M-I-X-L-R, and that's where all of our live stuff is. If you missed any of uh, the matches that we've done so far, you can go back and listen to them. If you missed the post-game show yesterday uh, after the, the wrap-up of the twos match with me, and Jarrett and Maddie and Jason, you get to hear the goals. You get to hear from Steve Cook. You get to hear from Luke Brennan. You get to hear from John Burner. You get to hear in a in a uh, in an eight inch or a twelve inch uh, DVD extra. Roy Laster, the head coach from Carolina Core. So that is uh, so that's uh, all that is going on here at the network. Once again, chasing guests for tomorrow because of uh, what's been going on and what we've been talking about over the last couple of days, last weeks, really. Uh, in the sport of soccer here as spring schedules are kicking off. And remember also next week we've got Open Cup as well. So Open Cup round twos are next week, and we'll be discussing that as we go forward. And we're also trying to track down our friends from uh, South Carolina United Heat with their win over Crown Legacy. And that might appear on the network hopefully later this afternoon, but we'll keep you posted on that. So very, very busy stuff across the board. Thanks for hanging out with us here on SDH as you always do. Thanks to Abe Gordon. Thanks to Jarrett. Thanks to Maddie. Thanks to Bart. And thanks to you, as always. Thanks for hanging out with us and being a part of the conversation as we are uh, leaving our international window and heading back into Major League Soccer. Tomorrow we'll talk MLS. We'll talk whatever else is on your mind. Hopefully we'll have some guests to talk about some of the news of the day. Keep an eye on Pro and the PSRA vote. Ending at midnight, seven years, tentative agreement on the table that they're chasing after. And we'll talk about all of that as well. So once again, 9.05 tomorrow morning. We will discuss everything going on in the world of soccer. We've been doing it for, uh, this is our eighth season, and uh, we could not be any more humbled that you guys come and hang out with us every single day that you do. So uh, uh, we'll just go ahead and end it uh, on a note like this. That's an absolute banger. And Jess is not wrong. Dos Acero, once again, seven times in a row, the United States has beaten Mexico and uh, Atlanta United now back in town. You've got Chicago coming up on the weekend. So for everybody here at SDH, Mucha Plotzi, I'll play it safe. And since it's the end of the show, that means I get to do this. We'll be back at it again, 9.05 Eastern time tomorrow morning. Play it safe. Enjoy your lunch. We'll catch up soon.